OTB AM with Gillette. Put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. It's Europa League night. That means it's Thursday, the 11th of March. Uh, very welcome along to OTB AM. It's Jerry Gilroy and Owen Sheehan with you this morning and every morning from half past seven all the way through until 10 a.m. We bring you all the best stories from around the world of sport. And, uh, you know, if you have some good opinions, we're happy to air them too. You can uh, drop a comment on the YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash off the ball for the live stream. The best place to live stream us these days, of course, is the OTB Sports app. You can download that free in either of the app stores. And, of course, you can always text us on 87 9180 Owen, good morning to you. You would be a fantastic darts announcer. The, a sort of monotonous 180 whenever Phil Taylor hits three consecutive Oh, well, another 180. Oh. What is going on here? This keeps happening. It's obviously easy. Any of these any of these men can do it. And women. Mm, yeah. Well I would I would I would pay that. I, I, I think that there is still good scope for a sort of undercover documentary style thing where you infiltrate City West on Darts Night. Or the Three Arena, wherever they have it now. Yeah. Uh okay. I mean I this is not your best uh, content idea, but we can run with it and see what happens. What's the outcome? What, what do you think is going to happen, Owen? What, what, are they going to kill me? Is that what will happen? Will there be violence? Will I be the source of the, the, uh, the, is it the Rosetta Stone, of the violence, that, the hooliganism that suddenly in, inflicts dart like a virus? Mm. Yeah, you'll be forced down a pitcher once, once they find you to, to prove your worth. Uh, like, I mean, if you try to infiltrate a tribe somewhere, they might check to see if you've got the correct tattoos. If once you infiltrate darts, they need to check to make sure that you can down a pitcher within 40 seconds. I would back you to do that, so I think you'd be okay. I mean, look, in, in the words of the old GAA people of the 80s and 90s, it's fair to say I wintered well, so I've certainly acquired the right belly shape for uh, being in the front row of the darts, and I'd be happy enough to get my top off in the company of other men whose, whose jiggles were, were wobbling and, and tickling all around the place. Uh, yeah. We should move on and talk about proper athletes, and that's uh, Liv should. Liverpool last night. Um, Liverpool beat Red Bull twice. Uh, Red Bull gives you wins is the headline on one of the tabs, which is undoubtedly tab of the morning to you. And it does, back-to-back -back wins, and their home win, a kind of important home win in the context of the six successive games that Liverpool have lost at Anfield. So, are you buying it? Are Liverpool back? Is this it? Calm, calm down, calm down, everybody. Yeah? This is actually really interesting, what happened last night. Um, you can look at it in a couple of ways. Initially, the reaction to Fabinho being back in midfield and Liverpool playing well might seem a little bit hysterical from Liverpool fans because it seems all too silver bullet for what's going on at Liverpool. It seems that their problems are so deep that you can't possibly move a player who's been playing predominantly at centre-back into midfield and fix everything. However... The difference was stark, and you actually can't blame Liverpool fans for maybe getting a little bit carried away and maybe thinking that this is the silver bullet to their lack of success recently. I was looking back at the stats, and it is remarkable that Jurgen Klopp hasn't tried this before last night. Fabinho has not played a full game in midfield since Van Dijk got injured. That was the game, the 2 all against Everton was the last game he started in midfield, and he hasn't been played there since. It's obvious why it hasn't been the case, but it is remarkable that Jurgen Klopp hasn't realised that it was a square peg in a round hole until last night, which makes me think that maybe it's not the answer that Jurgen Klopp sees something else, but maybe really last night was a revelation for him. What a lot of people are talking about in the aftermath of last night as well is Fabinho being brilliant and how much of an impact that's having on the rest of the midfield, namely Thiago. And Thiago plays this unbelievable over-the-top pass to Mo Salah for a brilliant chance in the first half. It's like a karate kick. It's gorgeous. And if you're watching the highlights last night, you're like, Thiago on the ball, his passing, true to, his passing stats must be true to roof as a result of Fabinho playing well last night, which wasn't the case at all. I, again, it's interesting if you dig into the stats of Thiago. He completed 38 passes last night. 
over the course of the past month, he's been regularly tipping into the 80s. So he completed 88 against West Ham, 82 against Brighton, 81 against Everton. From centre back. Thiago's passing the ball. Yeah, Thiago's passing the ball much less when he's in the Champions League, but he's doing it much more effectively. If you compare his average passes in the Champions League, now it's only against Leipzig and two legs, to his average in the Premier League, it is vastly different. One is in the 30s, one is in the 70s. So this Champions League run is going to be something that suits Thiago, it's going to be something that suits Liverpool, but it probably is helped down the road again by the fact that Fabinho is back. Now, the one other thing I just want to pick out from last night is that Fabinho will be mentioned as somebody who was disrupting the Leipzig play and uh, his tackling was brilliant, which it was. His interceptions were excellent as well. But the man with the most successful tackles on the pitch last night was Thiago. He made six successful tackles. And this is the moment where uh, Kenny Cunningham is no longer sitting on the throne of uh, uh, good hot takes from the start of the season. Uh, I'm, I'm sure Liverpool fans will point to those six successful tackles last night as a, as a defensive masterclass from Thiago. And you couldn't really are blame you, him for getting a little bit carried away. Are you putting your house on it that that will repeat and that that's going to be the case for the next four or five games? In your, can we just go back to your... Sorry, I, I thought you were still talking about um, Fabinho's passing stats when you moved on to Thiago. What is your theory behind why there is such a difference between uh, Thiago's passing stats in the Premier League and his passing stats in Europe? Because the defences don't sit as deep, they're creating more opportunities, more of those passes are probably forward. If I had to take a guess, I haven't looked at the direction of the passes, but I would guess a lot of them are forward, like, a, like that karate kick ball over the top, which you can't really do in the Premier League because Sheffield United will have 10 men inside their own half, uh, whereas Leipzig play uh, quite a high line and they take you on. And you will get that arrogance off every team you play in the Champions League. So this is the tournament that Liverpool fans are, have obviously been targeting this season once they realise that the Premier League title is... As uh, defense has, has completely fallen away. At full time uh, last night, Tommy Martin was making the point that uh, it's a home win of sorts, and Brian Kerr was like, "Watch now how over the top Klopp is about how important this victory is because it's this or bust essentially for the rest of the season." Do they somehow manage to magic away all of the difficulties that they've been having in Anfield because they won last night? Is, is there a possibility that this is legitimately a turning point and that they can they can now say, "Look, we're a team who's been to the final." who has won us, uh, who, you know, probably could have gone much deeper in the tournament than we did uh, collectively as a group, essentially. That whole group has been together um, and they have a, they've, they've just brought in somebody who's won the, the Champions League. That they can just stick their eggs in this basket now and not really care about the league, be far more relaxed and maybe enjoy those games a bit more, rest players if they need to, and just say, right, it's Champions League or bus for us. Maybe, yeah. I, I also do really like to look at Liverpool's next few Premier League fixtures. And it's important to see how they look in the Premier League with Fabinho starting in midfield. They've got Wolves and they've got Arsenal as their next two games. Those are the sorts of teams that Liverpool on song could tear apart because both of those teams have an air of arrogance about them that might suggest that they could take Liverpool on in this stage. Wolves maybe less so this season, but Arsenal will certainly show up uh, to the Emirates Stadium and be like, we're going to take Liverpool and end up getting smashed 4-0 by Liverpool. Uh, they've got Villa after that, the revenge mission. They've got Leeds after that, and Bielsa's left himself open to, to these sorts of games quite a bit, not least the reverse fixture against Liverpool. And then they've got United at the start of April. Like they, Those are some really exciting Premier League fixtures for Liverpool fans this morning, looking at Fabinho's performance last night and thinking... Right, they've got something now to, to work off because it doesn't matter who you play at centre back as a result of Fabinho being back, it seems. Like all Nat Phillips had to do last night was head the ball, and he's really good at heading the ball and he's really good at clearing the ball. But there's just less of an onus on your centre backs to be really good and dominant and Virgil van Dijk esque when Fabinho's in midfield. Yeah, but you'll be able to stick Henderson, you could, you'll probably be able to stick Fabinho back centre back, and that might be what they do, or maybe they stick Henderson back centre back instead of one of those two as well, so you, you're not relying on them, there's a bit of depth there and there's a bit of cover. Right, OTBAM is live in association with Gillette. Good morning, start with Gillette, giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. Owen thinks Liverpool are back. Phil Egan, good morning to you. Good morning, how are you doing, lads? Are Liverpool back? Uh, I don't think so, no. Um, if they could play in Budapest every week, they'd be fine, but no, it was... It was good. Like the, it was very similar to the first leg where they gave up a few chances, did plenty of chances, weren't clinical enough. But then when they got the first goal, it just seems to relax them. And just like three weeks ago, the Salah and Mane both scored. But I, I thought up until the, the goals went in, Mane in particular having a very tough night. It's very strange watching this version of Sadio Mane because it's been so good since he arrived from Southampton. But he's obviously not the same Mane at the moment. Maybe the goal will do his confidence, the world of good. I think having Jota there, 
he's only going to get better. Obviously, he's just coming back from injury. But you know, he the three of them combined for that first goal, and you you see Mo Salah is a lot more clinical when he's on the right and he can cut in on the left like he did for the goal. Whereas you think back to the chance he had in the first half where he was on the left hand side and he shot straight at the keeper and then follow up. I don't know what Mane was trying to do, but yeah, I think a lot more encouraging in terms of having Fabinho in midfield, but I would wonder what Klopp will do in the quarterfinals because there's a good chance Henderson will be available. Will he put Henderson in the sixth role and drop Fabinho back? Matt Phillips had a great game last night. Everything was put into the box. He cleared. You play against a more clinical team, a team with a better attack, and maybe that's where your your central defenders will be will be tested a lot more. It, who was, do you, it was quite a comfortable night for them. Who do you want in the quarterfinals? Uh, well, you, you think Porto would be the team that you'd want. Um, obviously, if you knock Juventus out, you've got to have something about you. And they were, they were quite dogged in that game the other night. But Liverpool would fancy the chances of beating Porto. Uh, Liverpool Dortmund would be an exciting game. Obviously, Haaland is the, the main man at the moment. But they gave up chances at the back as well. So that could be a goal fest. Liverpool want to avoid City and Bayern Munich or PSG as well. Uh, I'd love to see them get PSG. That'll, that'll be decent over two legs. Um, one last question on this. If instead it was uh, Sadio Mane who got through instead of Diego Jota for the first goal, does that ball get squared to Mo Salah if it's Mane? Don't know. Don't know. Maybe Jota's going to be the peacemaker between the two of them. Because he went out of his way to create. I'm like, you're straight, you're clean through one on one there. And uh, I mean, obviously it worked out very well. But uh, it was very kind of him, I thought, to uh, pass that ball. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at times Liverpool overplayed in the final third. You think the Thiago chance where you're just thinking, just shoot, and he passed the ball to Salah. There was a few times where that final ball let them down and they weren't clinical and you thought maybe they'll get punished. And Serlot hits the crossbar and then the tie completely changes. But yeah, it, it's what they can do now in the Premier League and having Fabinho back should give them a bit more confidence. They're away to Wolves next Monday. The problem with playing Wolves is Wolves are so good on the counter-attack that if Liverpool try and squeeze Wolves and play a high line, Wolves is the kind of team that can punish them. But also as well, it's a chance for Liverpool maybe to scout a few more Wolves players after the success of Jota. All right, what else is going on? Well, obviously, while that was going on, I mean, I was told, what are you doing watching Liverpool and Leipzig? This Barcelona and PSG game is unbelievable. The first half, have you seen Messi's goals? So Messi scores an unbelievable goal, also has a penalty saved. Who knows what that second half would have been like? But that one all drop for PSG sends them into the quarterfinals, 5-2 in aggregate. The draw, by the way, will take place tomorrow week. And first time since 2005, there'll be no Messi or Ronaldo in the quarterfinals of the competition. 2005, who won the Champions League that season? I'm just, just throwing it out there. You've got Mayo, you've got Mayo roots, definitely. There's like that, that, that seems to be contagious. <laughs> that whole, oh, there's a Mayo man in the White House, we're going to win. And no, no, no that's not that, that if, and I know Jurgen Klopp, I know you're going to go into more detail about Liverpool. Jurgen Klopp was asked, you know, could, can Liverpool go on and win the Champions League? And he said, the difference with this team now and the team that would have got to the finals consecutively was they were in decent form in the Premier League where they're not at the moment. But uh, who knows if they get a good draw. Speaking of Manchester City, 14 points clear at the top of the Premier League once again. 5-2 win at home to Southampton. So they bounced back from the Manchester Derby. And despite the win, Riyad Mahrez scored two goals, but Pep Guardiola not happy with John Moss and VAR. And you can understand why Phil Foden was denied clear penalty in the first half. Alex McCarthy took him down. Foden's biggest mistake was he tried to get back up. If he had stayed down, there's no doubt the penalty would have been awarded. Saying that, though, VAR looks at it and they still don't give the penalty. So this is why players go down and they're probably told to stay down because when they're too honest, they don't get the penalties. didn't matter because obviously City were so dominant, but imagine it was nil all with two minutes to go and that incident happens. Maybe it would have been different, but... More action tonight. It's the last 16 of the Europa League. Manchester United and AC Milan at Old Trafford is the pick of the ties. No Zlatan Ibrahimovic for that game, though. Five to six, that one gets underway. At also have newly crowned champions in Scotland, Rangers away to Slavia Prague. Then at eight o'clock, it's Arsenal away to Olympiacos and Tottenham host Dinamo Zagreb. Amateur jockey Rob James was last night handed a four-month ban from racing 
the IHRB handed down a 12 month ban, the last eight months suspended though. That was after the video emerged last week of James mimicking riding on a recently deceased horse. And the Players' Championship gets underway at Sawgrass later on today. Rory McIlroy, defending champion from 2019, obviously last year's competition or tournament was postponed after the first round due to the pandemic. So McIlroy among the early starters due to tee off at 20 to 1. Gray McDowell will go out about half an hour before that. And Shane Larry is due to tee off after 6 o'clock. Yeah, McElroy's on Jimmy Fallon saying he's getting texts from Tiger Woods giving out about how bad he's playing himself, which is a brilliant self-deprecating name-dropping story, but also a little bit concerning that while Tiger Woods' leg is practically hanging off, he's still thinking, wow, I'm in a better state than you are, Rory. Yeah, and if you're going to wear red on the final day, Rory, you've got to play like me and not stink the place out. What was the 76 at the Arnold Palmer Invitational? Like, you look at the stats, Rory's, and you see all the top tens, but you realise that doesn't contend enough and um yeah maybe maybe this is the tournament maybe who knows if, if he's going to win the masters maybe he has to go completely in under the radar but it's very hard because he gives an interview and he's asked about winning the masters and then the quotes are out there and he doesn't win it and then the question is will he ever win it phil just to go back to the the uh, liverpool situation i was chatting with Owen before you came on there about the possibility of them essentially relaxing into the league now and saying look I mean, it's a complete mess, but we are playing well in Europe. Those teams will have to come out and try and beat us. Potentially, Porto might be, I know you say they're the, the dream draw, but actually a team who's coming out and attacking and leaving some space in behind might be the type of team that this Liverpool side needs at the moment because they haven't been particularly creative against the sides who dropped deep. Um, notwithstanding that, is there a possibility that they actually just relax into the league now and, and start playing much better football on the basis that it's very clear what they need to do this year to somehow salvage this season? Yeah, I, I think one thing I would have been worried about going into the game last night was if Liverpool get knocked out, that's it, the season is over. Now, I'm not saying Liverpool are going to win the Champions League. Personally, I don't think they can win it. But at least it's prolonged now that they have a quarterfinal to look forward to. That There is players now in the squad saying to Jurgen Klopp, I want to get into that team for the first leg of the quarterfinal. So there, there is that to play for and maybe that can spark some sort of a run going in the Premier League. Again, I think they've done they, they've too much work to do to finish in the top four. And I'm of the opinion I'd nearly rather them not finish in the Europa League places than finish in them because it just means next season with players back. And the encouraging sign for Liverpool fans watching the game last night was Fabinho was back. And there's been so much talk about what will they be like next season. Well, if they have all these players back, then they're going to be good again. So it's not it's not the crisis. At the moment, they're not in good form, but it's not as if this is it, like Klopp has to go and there's no way back. You bring some of these players back in, Liverpool will be good again, but they still do need to recruit in the summer. Here's the thing, that the quality of the performance last night wasn't perfect. Absolutely wasn't no. them at their absolute swashbuckling, we're the best team in Europe best, but several players improved. Like, you got contributions from players, even from Origi. You got you got contributions from the fullbacks, which were better combined than they have been in recent weeks, which is kind of would suggest that actually, largely it's been about the injuries as opposed to some fundamental other problem, which is underlying and therefore they've been worked out and therefore this is terminal. It didn't feel that way last night. And it didn't feel that way when they were winning games on the road in London, those two games back-to-back -back against good teams either. That There's been enough signs that make you just very confused about why this is happening if it, is, if it isn't just the injuries. Yeah, and I think as well when you watch Liverpool, if they concede the first goal, then it just seems that psychologically they think we can't come back from this. Whereas last season, watching Liverpool, over the last few years, when they concede you almost look at the clock and you think, right, they've half an hour to turn this around. They'll do it, no problem. I think as well, one performance to, to mention as well, Thiago. Probably in the, in the first half, some of his, his best football for Liverpool because Fabinho was in there. And Thiago actually wasn't going around sliding and throwing in desperation tackles. He actually dispossessed a few Leipzig players and didn't give away that many frees. So that, that's the, the knock-on effect of that as well, where Fabinho and Henderson beside Thiago then you get the best out of Thiago. But it's been symptomatic of Liverpool's struggles in midfield, that Thiago's performances 
haven't been very good. A lot gets thrown at him. They were so bad against Fulham the other day. Thiago wasn't on the pitch, so you cannot yeah. blame him for everything. Yeah, and look, I suppose that's the whole point about the, the team being the sum of its parts, and that's why good management gets more out of uh, some players than other managers have been able to do. Phil, good stuff. Thanks a million. We'll leave it there Thanks, this morning. You can hear more from Phil uh, across the day, and of course you can read him on otbsports.com and on the OTB Sports app, I want to tell you. A reminder, of course, uh, that OTB AM is live in association with Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. Here's what's going up on the show between now and 10 o'clock this morning. Andy Burke from BBC Scotland is going to join us right now to talk to us about the uh, Ireland-Scotland game on Sunday. Daniel Harris is going to join us at 8.15 to preview tonight's game. Look back a little bit at last night. The director of the League of Ireland, Mark Scanlon, uh, is going to join us for an in-depth chat about the state of the game in the League of Ireland at the moment. We'll talk with John Duggan about the Clare crisis in hurling. That's the subject of his column today. It's a compare and contrast with how they're doing things in Limerick. The Cheltenham countdown. Cheltenham's really upon us at this point. Tom Malone's going to join us at five past nine. And then we've got your TV picks to get your weekend viewing sorted with Sue Murphy at 9.15. And Andy Nicholl and Eve Briggs are going to play us out this morning. But it is with Scotland that we're starting this morning because we're very interested to see exactly how confident they are in Scotland at the moment. Andy Burke of BBC Radio Scotland joins us. Andy, good morning to you. How are you? Good morning. I'm good, Lance. How are you? This could have been a massive, massive game for Scotland if um, we, we're in exactly the same situation. If only we hadn't had a sending off against Wales, the whole season would be different. <laughs> but for you guys, a win in Twickenham gets completely ruined by the fact that you just couldn't back it up the next week. So what should have been looking forward to a triple crown for you guys, all of a sudden is like, geez, we've got to win this game now. Yeah, it's, it's very frustrating. Um, as you say, the win at Twickenham came probably unexpectedly given that we hadn't won there for 38 years. So to get off to the best possible start and then you're looking at Wales, as I'm sure Ireland did in the opening weekend, and you felt it maybe wasn't a, a vintage Wales side, and then you go 17-3 up and you think you've got them exactly where you want them. To let them off the hook was hugely frustrating from a Scotland perspective. And you said that they're at the top. Backing it up has been Scotland's problem over the years. They've been a an on their day team. They can they can turn over anyone when they get it right. But just going and doing it week after week and putting that together in the space of a single championship is still the the big doubt that surrounds this team. They've clearly got all the constituent parts, as you say, on the day to do it. What is preventing them from? being consistent over a period of time, and not just one game, but but over a tournament like this, for example? I, th I think it's, um, I think a lot of it's still a little mental challenge to get over. Um, I think they seem to be building, and I think they are building in the right direction, but I think that Wales game encapsulated a lot. The way Wales hung in the fight were never beaten and when Scotland let them off the hook, found a way to get it done despite not playing particularly well in that game. And I think it's just that know-how, that streetwise uh, ability to win when perhaps you don't really deserve to. I think Scotland are still lacking in that department somewhat. They've made huge strides in many areas of their game. Their scrum has improved out of sight. Their set-piece generally has improved. Their defence has proved beyond recognition since the World Cup. But I think there's still just that little bit of know-how on how to get over the line. And uh, as you see, backing up one big win, that's the, the sign of a, a, a team of real contenders. And that's maybe the area that Scotland are still just lacking a little bit at the moment. Andy, we were speaking yesterday about a lot of the stuff that's been written and said about Scotland down through the years. How much does that seep into the mentality of the players, that there is a siege mentality somewhat to uh, what something like Eddie O'Sullivan would have said about them, for example, at the end of last year? Well, I know they're aware of it. Uh, we had Stuart Hogg on our podcast um, a, f a few weeks back, and I know he was he was aware of it. Um, I think they get frustrated. I think it annoys them. But I think there's a realisation there that until you can shut these critics up with your results, then they leave themselves open to it. And I think, you know, Ireland's record in particular against Scotland is, is incredible. You know, Scotland have won just once uh, in their last 10 attempts against Ireland. They finished above them in the Six Nations just once in the Six Nations era. So with that sort of record, you leave yourself open to to those sort of, of criticisms. And 
I get a little uncomfortable. I remember Ronan O'Gara making similar comments ahead of the 2017 game, uh, which worked out not too badly because that was the one that Scotland came out on the right side of. But um, I think until you can reverse that um, on the pitch, then, you know, you, if you leave people a reason to criticise, then they're going to take it. Eddie O'Sullivan, perhaps more than most, would uh, be inclined to get stuck in, I would suggest. But reading some comments this week from some of the, the ex-Ireland guys, we spoke to Rory Best earlier in the week. I think there is a respect for Scotland there. Um, and I think one of the reasons that Ireland's record is so good is that they do have a respect for Scotland and wouldn't fall into the trap that perhaps England have done in recent years of underestimating Scotland. They know these guys well from the Pro 14. They know their individual qualities. And they know, as we said, on their day, if Scotland get it right, they are a tough proposition. So I think that's been been a big strength of Ireland over the last few years, that they haven't fallen into the trap of underestimating Scotland, but actually giving them the respect they deserve. And that's why they're able to produce such good performances against them. How tough were the questions within Scotland when you see all that stuff coming from outside? Is it just a preserve of uh, Irish pundits to uh, slay Scotland or is there a lot of challenging going on inside the country as well? I think certainly in the wake of the World Cup, there were some serious questions asked that tournament in Japan. They just got it so wrong. Um, that opening game against Ireland could barely have gone worse for Scotland um, and then obviously been knocked out in the pool stage is failure in anyone's language. So in the wake of the World Cup, there was a lot of tough questions asked of Gregor Townsend, of his players, um, where these guys up to it. And then, of course, the, the Six Nations, the 2026 Nations, you had the Finn Russell saga. And Scotland really seemed to be in a bad spot at that stage. Gregor Townsend seemed to be in a bad spot. But I think what we saw from them in that Six Nations, while they didn't, of course, get themselves into championship contention, we saw a bit more of that steel and, and a bit more of that recognition from Scotland that you're not going to be able to win on a consistent basis playing this otherworldly, on-the-edge attacking rugby. You need the basics, you need your set piece, you need your defence to be on top. And Scotland have addressed that. They're not the finished article, but over the past year or so, we've seen them becoming a steelier proposition. So with that, the questions are still being asked, but I think there's a recognition that, that Gregor Townsend, and, and, and let's not forget, he made significant changes to his coaching staff after the World Cup, which was a bold move. I think there's a recognition, recognition within the Scottish media and the Scottish fans that they've made moves in the right direction. Now, there's clearly, as the Wales game demonstrated, a way to go. But if you compare where they are now from where they were post-World Cup, I think there's there's been great strides there. The way the World Cup went in most countries, the head coach would have ended up being a sacrificial lamb. How did he manage to survive? Was was that part of was was changing the coaching ticket part of the deal to look, we'll try something new? And did he just have enough in the bank that would suggest, look, there's no other alternatives out there, there's no silver bullet to this, it's it's going to be a long out road back. And like how did he convince everybody that he was the man to do it? Well, firstly, the the SRU had taken a not a gamble, but but really um, the move to replace Vern Cotter was a big call because when Vern Cotter came in, he restored Scotland as a, a credible force. You'll remember before Vern arrived, Scotland weren't even a, a not on their day team. They, they were they were pretty hopeless, let's be honest. And from the 2015 World Cup, Vern started building things and they st Scotland started to pick off big results against Ireland, against Wales, against France, uh, teams they just hadn't had a sniff at uh, for quite a few years. So to replace Vern halfway through a World Cup cycle was a big call from the SRU and Vern wanted to take Scotland through to the 2019 World Cup. So to bring in Gregor at that stage, um, Mark Dodson had, had put all his chips on Gregor Townsend, so it would have taken a lot for him to replace him. But I don't know if the discussions went very far in terms of replacing him. I, I don't think they did. I think uh, Mark Dodson was convinced that Gregor was still the man. But I think Gregor himself realised in terms of the coaching that things weren't quite right. And hearing 
people around him close to the coaching team during that World Cup. I don't think the dynamic was right. I don't think his, his assistants were being heard as much as they would have liked. I don't think their input was as great as they would have liked. And Gregor is a very strong character and had very clear ideas on how he wanted the game to be played. Um, and now you could say if his assistants weren't making themselves heard and weren't uh, having the influence that they should have done, then that's just as much on them as it is on Gregor. So the dynamic wasn't quite right. They were good coaches, but I don't think the chemistry was quite what it should have been or perhaps once had been. So it was Gregor, I think, that was the driving force in identifying, right, I need some new voices in here, some new ideas. And the guys that he's brought in have had a fantastic effect. Peter de Villiers on the scrum has has just reinvented that Scotland scrum to the point where what was once a weakness is now a strength. Uh, John DL has come in, promoted from within, um, and has got the pack of forwards playing really, really well. And Steve Tandy is probably the standout, isn't he, in terms of defence. The Scotland defence was was uh, incredibly leaky over the years. Um, really, you were looking at Scotland having to score five tries to cancel out the opponent's four if they were going to win a game. Now they've got the stingiest defence, or certainly did in the last six nations. So the moves that he made have paid off, um, but there's still need to, there's still plenty of room for improvement, certainly. Can I ask you what the perception is of uh, France in particular with the way the whole postponement was handled and their investigation into uh, who patient zero was? Uh, I mean, I hate to stereotype, but look, it's the Six Nations, that's the whole point of this, right? It was uh, so typically French to look down their noses at the rest of us and insist that this tournament was only going to go ahead because they have the best protocols and they were going to make sure that we all followed their protocols and then they're the ones who break the protocols. So, <laughs> you know, uh, what are the, I, it doesn't affect us as, anyway as badly as it has affected you guys. It kind of, I mean, we played their best team, but uh, surely people in Scotland are tearing their hair out. Yeah, I think there's a lot of frustration at that. I think initially it looked like, <clears throat> excuse me, Scotland might get an opportunity to take on a weakened France team, which, given our record in Paris, might have been no bad thing. But uh, clearly things progressed and, and that didn't happen. I think what has been said publicly and what has been said privately are two different matters. I think there's a lot of, of anger in the Scotland camp about the way France have gone about this because they have have been meticulous in the way that they have, have planned and followed the, the protocols to try and minimise the risk to their team. And, and as you say, to the tournament in general. So to see the French team seemingly um, so casual uh, with the rules is a massive, a massive frustration. And I think there's a bit of mixed feelings amongst the Scottish rugby public. On the one hand, you would say if, you, if justice was to be done, Scotland should be awarded that game and awarded the victory. But it would be the most hollow of victories, wouldn't it? And I think it's important for Scotland, and, and Gregor Townsend would say the same, I think. Uh, this test is important for Scotland, and they want this game played to go and test themselves against France, to go and see if they can put another long, winless away run to bed like they've done at Twickenham, like they've done down in Wales, albeit in empty stadiums. But these were records that desperately needed to end. But I just wonder, in the grand scheme of things, if um, this postponement might not work in Scotland's favour anyway, just given the, the nature of the, the Wales game, it gives them a bit of time to get over it. It was such a gut-wrenching way to to lose. Um, you've now got back-to-back -back home games. Obviously, Sunday will be a tough game. Then you've got Italy, but you've got a chance to to regain a little bit of momentum. If you can if you can put together back-to-back -to -back wins, then suddenly you've got a chance going to Paris still in title contention, which is something that Scotland haven't done in the longest time. Andy, what do you think of Ireland? What's the, the general consensus amongst you and your colleagues about where we are at the moment? Because obviously we're going through well, it shouldn't be a transition period, but any time a new coach comes in, the, the players haven't transitioned much, but uh, the results are kind of transitioning. <clears throat> yeah, and I think, um, listen, I think when you follow someone who's been around as long and was as successful as Joe Schmidt, then that transitional phase is inevitable. And I think that's the view of, of Ireland at the moment. Uh, in Scotland, is, yes, maybe they're not the 
the well-oiled machine that they were at the height of the, the Joe Schmidt era, but there's still plenty of players that, that contributed massively to that success that are still there and and still capable. And you look at their key guys, Johnny Sexton, he's maybe not at the best time in, in the last couple of seasons, but all of a sudden a Lions year comes around and he looks to be stepping it up a bit more again. And um, the, there's no way that any Scotland fan would allow themselves to think that the Ireland are vulnerable purely because, as I said about Wales earlier, they've just got that ability um, to, in a tight game, to get themselves over the line. And obviously the most recent meeting between the sides in December, uh, the, the first half was pretty tight. The second half, Ireland won with a bit to spare. So I think I look at them and I see an Ireland team that are, are looking to shift away a little bit from what we know of them in recent years, that that kicking game, that territory game. Um, I think they're looking to put a little bit more width on the ball. And when you transition into that type of game, that's always going to take a bit of time. But seeing them against Italy, it looked like they were starting to, there were signs they were starting to put it together, albeit against limited opposition. But I think they remain a, a hugely dangerous side. And I don't think anyone in Scotland uh, will be going in expecting anything other than a really tough, tight game at the weekend. Is there confidence that this summer, Andy, Scotland don't get overlooked when it comes to the Lions? Because that has been the relationship between you and the Lions for quite some time, hasn't it? Yeah, it's, it's been the recent tours that the, the relationship between Scotland and the Lions has diminished to the point of you've now got a generation of Scotland fans who have no real connection with the Lions. They don't see their heroes, when it, certainly when it comes to the Test Series, they don't see their Scottish heroes involved and there's no real buy-in for them. So, I mean, guys like me that grew up with the, the 97 and uh, well, certainly the 97 tour where Scots had a huge influence. I love the Lions. It, it, it's one of my favourite aspects of, of interna international rugby, but a lot of guys haven't got that sort of thing to cling on to. So in terms of this summer, um, I, I think Sunday is, is a huge game in that Lions context. Um, it's a huge game for both teams in terms of where their Six Nations goes. If, if Ireland lose, then... That's one from four, and that's a, a bit of a disaster by Irish standards. If Scotland lose, then it's it's looking like another one of those Six Nations that just starts to get away from them. And Warren Gatland probably isn't going to be cherry-picking too many players from a team that finishes fourth or fifth in the championship. So that goes for both Scotland and Ireland on the weekend. I would like to think there's more guys that are, are putting their hands up um, Certainly in the, the pack of forwards, I think uh, the, the tight five, there's more more guys there that, that you could see in that red jersey. Um, Rory Sutherland uh, in the front row, I think, has is, is got a real shot. Xander Fagerson's ban has, has probably damaged the chances, but you would like to think Warren Gatlin knows what he could do. Johnny Gray seems to have gone to a new level since he's been at Exeter, and then you look at the back row guys. Hamish Watson, if he doesn't go, I think there's something far wrong. I think he was unlucky four years ago. And I think Jamie Ritchie is, is looking like a real class act as well. And then in the backs, Finn Russell, Stuart Hogg, a couple others, you would hope those guys have a chance. So I think there are plenty of candidates that are capable, in my eyes, of stepping up and becoming Lions. Um, but I think a lot depends on how these next two or three weeks pan out, because... Warren Gatland will want some guys bouncing into that Lions camp, coming off a really strong Six Nations. And of course, Andy, we need to think about the greater good here because uh, ministers at Westminster think that this could save the union, that with Scottish independence <laughs> back on the table, uh, it's important uh, for this Lions tour to happen. So uh, it's vital, really, that Scotland get a good representation here. <laughs> I can't imagine anyone in the rugby uh, world couching it in those terms, to be honest, that I can't imagine too many of the players or coaches who are going to be involved or think about, thinking about it in those terms. Um, look, uh, every uh, major sporting event um, politicians will cling on to for dear life. Um, but I, I think in uh, in terms of your motivation for making alliance to it and, uh, and being any part of it, um, I can't imagine it's uppermost in these guys' minds when they, uh, they take the field on Six Nations weekend. 
Andy, good stuff. Thanks a million for joining us today. Cheers. Cheers, guys. All the best. Andy Burke of BBC Scotland there. It's 10 minutes past eight this morning here on OTBAM. Plenty more to come. We've got the papers and Daniel Harris up next. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. The Saturday panel on OTB. And I find myself during commentary, sometimes a thread will appear in my mind and it'll be like a worm. You know, it's there. I know this might happen and I've got it ready to go. And that would have been the nation holds its breath thing because I couldn't have scripted that penalty in Genoa in 1990. And it just came to me in the moment. But it came to me because of all that I had done beforehand. And I, it was there ready to emerge at, at the right moment. Don't miss the panel every Saturday afternoon on OTB Sports Radio. Tune in 24-7 on the OTB Sports app. It's the Cheltenham Festival, the biggest week in jump racing. And what a day of action we have in store for you today. And here's the Cheltenham favourite, number four, definitely punching. And you can see why, Gina. He hasn't got the most attractive head. He's a leggy sort with a robotic stride, but he has an impressive turn of foot for his size. He must be 20 hands at least. He's moved stables a lot, but he's in form at home. Just loves the big occasion. Jumps for fun. Feature at stud, Gina. Not sure, Matt. Unlikely to be wanted for breeding. It's nearly time. Worthy favourite, Matt? Definitely the favourite, Gina. He's prepared. He'll stay all day. Even the Irish will back this English banker. This Cheltenham don't feel like a punter. Feel like a favourite. With great offers on the Paddy Power app. Paddy Power. Feel like a favourite. I heard you picking your all-time five-a-side team at one stage and you put Gerard and Alonso in midfield and I thought, well, fair enough, who else could it be? And then I'm thinking, well, you play with Luka Modric. Mm. Was it just that Luka yeah. Modric at that Spurs stage wasn't maybe the player he was four or five years ago at Real Madrid? I can't remember uh, that team because I've picked a few five-a-side teams and <laughs> Modric, has always, Modric has always been in it. Um, so who are you leaving out, Gerard or Alonso? Oh, I'm, leaving, I'm leaving Alonso out, not because, you know, I've said that quickly, but... Modric was a uh, was unbelievable, and um, Gerard was the best player I played with, but but Modric was a joke, and I think they complement each other really well. But um, in, in what way was Modric a, a joke? Oh, just like you know, I, I, I just didn't see him lose the ball, um, and it's one of those you know in an era where we all talk about stats and assists and goals. You know, he's not he's not going to be top of all those those lists. You know, like tackles or work rate but with the a footballing eye to watch someone like Luka Modric she's he, he was a genius just I, I watched him wriggle out of positions um in training um I, I can't remember him ever give, give the ball away he, he, he dictated the tempo of football matches he dictated games um he always had a knife for a pass he could score a goal he was uh, he was a beautiful player to watch Sean, what's that thing going round the garden? That is my, uh, our new Husqvarna auto mower. Auto mower? Yeah, it's a robotic lawn mower from Husqvarna. Cuts the grass automatically, has GPS tracking and an app. Even works in the rain. Hmm. I just thought, why spend time cutting grass when I could spend it with the family? Great! You can put the dinner on, so... Ah, no can do, love. Have to paint the man cave. Husqvarna Auto Mower. Never mow again. Learn more at husqvarna.ie. Tom Watson, you're welcome to Golf Weekly. Hey, this is going to be fun. Very happy to say you're being captain and, of course, three-time major winner, Padre Carrington, joins us. Today's special guest on Golf Weekly is Lee Westwood. Thank, thanks very much. <laughs> yeah, I'm honoured and delighted. Let's bring in Paul McGinley, who joins us now. Paul, you're very welcome. Shane Lowry, how are you keeping? I'm good, thanks, yeah. Well, I'm as good <laughs> as I can be. The biggest names in golf and Ireland's best golf podcast, Golf Weekly, now exclusively available on Patreon. Go to otbsports.com forward slash golf weekly to sign up. Up now. OTB AM. With Gillette, put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. It's 14 minutes past eight. You'll have heard well, Peter Crouch speaking with Nathan there in the ad break. It's a short clip from our interview with Crouch, which is going to be broadcast on Off the Ball and all our social channels from 8 pm this evening. He started Paddy Power's new Feel Like a Favour campaign for Cheltenham and uh, it's all about his acting chops in the ads. Uh, if you weren't watching it, if you are just listening there, you won't realise that he was actually in the ads. That was him they were talking about. Uh, let me very briefly run you through the sports pages. The front page of otbsports.com is Dunnock Ryan to leave Racing 92 at the end of the season. There is some talk that he'll continue 
with um, one of the teams who's top of the second, the Pro D2. So he's going to stay in France, it looks like. I would. I really thought he was going to be offered a contract by La Rochelle as a coach, but maybe he wants to keep playing for another year. Alex Ferguson regrets not telling Rangers director to F off over Catholic jibe. Uh, the, when, when he signed for Rangers, one of the directors asked if his wife was Catholic and if they'd been married in a chapel. And Ferguson said no in a registry office instead of actually telling them to F off. And that's uh, one of the regrets that he has. Um, and then Andy Nichol on uh, OTB on off the ball last night is also there. I'll run you through the rest of the headlines in a few minutes. As I said, top of the morning to you. Back of the sun is Red Bull gives you wins. Uh, two wins for Liverpool against uh, Red Bull. Now, um, uh, if you want to get in touch with us this morning, 0879-180-180 is the number. Daniel Harris is with us. Daniel, good morning to you. How are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you? Yeah, just before we get on to Manchester United tonight, um, did, Liverpool, did Liverpool turn their season around last night? Are they now just a Champions League team who can put, throw the towel in in the league and concentrate, put all their eggs, the remaining egg, one, one egg that they have, into uh, the Champions League basket? Uh, sort of. I mean, it doesn't quite work like that, in that the more games you win, probably the more you feel you're likely to win games. So I wouldn't say they turned it around last night because that 2 0 in the first leg meant that they could play with a bit, bit less pressure. But I mean, it would be silly to think that they couldn't win the Champions League because they can. And like Fabinho playing in midfield last night made a big difference to them. Uh, they're not the best team in Europe, but it's cup competition and you don't necessarily have to be. So no one will want to play them. And I'm sure that that will be their focus. And it would be, I mean, they would be very, very pleased indeed if they could come out of this with the Champions League. Uh, I still think that yeah, they're not as good as Manchester City this season. They're not as good as Bayern Munich. But it's not. But that would be tight games. So um, it's definitely possible. Well, I mean, if we look at Real Madrid's record in the Champions League, there were very few times when, over the last decade, you would have said they were the best team in Europe. And yet... They've won by far more Champions Leagues than anybody else over that period of time. Uh, yeah, if I was if I was club, that's what I would be telling everybody. I'd be on the on the, the videotrons around the, the uh, training ground and in the dressing room. I'd be like, oh, did Real Madrid win the Champions League that year? Were they the best team? No, they weren't. Yeah, I mean, I mean, obviously Madrid had Modric and Kroos and Ronaldo, who are players who are miles better than the players Liverpool have. But yeah, it is possible just to be good at winning cup competitions and. Um, Madrid were able to do it because ultimately they had enough unbelievable individuals who would do something when they needed it to be done in, in the big games. Liverpool's not quite about that. Liverpool's more of a collective effort, I think, and they need the system to be working and starting to get the players back into the system. I mean, if you've got Henderson and Fabinho in midfield, the defence is, and I Henderson is sort of injured, but the defence is going to have a lot less to do, so you're much more easily able to hide what's going on with the defence. Obviously, when you start playing the better teams towards the end of the competition, that becomes harder because you're much less likely to dominate possession. But if they get a friendly draw, then they're more than capable, and there are friendly draws to be had. I mean, Porto is there, for example. You want to avoid Paris, and you want to avoid Bayern Munich, but otherwise, uh, I'd take Liverpool to beat pretty much anyway. I mean, obviously, you don't play City either. So those those are the three best teams, I think. The teams, or at least the teams that, for whatever reason, you most want to avoid because Paris have individuals that can just kill you as well, more similar to Real Madrid, really. But the rest of the draw, you happily take. And uh, I would take Liverpool to beat everyone else, I think, in a two-leg tie. Even if Liverpool don't win the Champions League, Daniel, if they finish the Premier League season strong and maybe scrape into the top four, there will be a sense of excitement amongst Liverpool fans that they will definitely be back in the title race again next season. Do you see it that way? Uh, I think they'll be. In, I think I'd expect them to be in the title race next season anyway. Um, I mean, assuming everything stays the same, uh, I think the top four will be too much now. I don't think they're going to be able to win that many consecutive games. Um, I mean, again, it's not it's not impossible because we've seen these players do it before, but they seem to have lost that extra that means you win games when you play badly you keep winning tight games it just so i'm not i'm not sure they're going to get in the champions league but um we couldn't we can't ignore the very specific circumstances of this season and what they do next season is going to depend really on who they're able to buy i think and um assuming the players are still there because i don't see i mean i guess it's possible that the better players will leave 
or at least maybe Salah will leave, but no one's really got any money to buy him, so he might he might have to stay even if he even if he doesn't want to. And again, the, the very specific circumstances of this season, there's a reason why Man United and Man City are at the top of the league. And the t- obviously, one of the reasons is they're playing the best, but also they have the biggest squads. And if you look at what United were doing, uh, they were basically start. They were, they were finding ways to win games when they had their, all their players available. Uh, because what happened was was that um, Solskjaer was able to rotate from game to game. He was changing four or five players from every game. And although the cohesion wasn't quite what you'd want it to be because he was changing four or five players every game, it meant that they were fresh enough to find goals when they needed them and that they also had options on the bench. As soon as that stopped being the case, once Pogba got injured, once Van der Beek got injured, and basically the midfielders that were fit were the only midfielders that he had that were able to play. So they only had maybe three midfield players. Then the results started, stopped coming, really, when Cavani got injured also, when they started to run out of options up front. It's not a coincidence that that was the time the form started to tear off and everything started to be much harder work. Now, Liverpool never had that. Um, they had basically 12 or 13 players that Klopp trusted. And in this particular season, especially with the injuries and with the inability to rotate, it makes it much harder for them to produce a good level because... They brought Jota to be that rotation player so that they could start, they had four strikers, so they could start leaving leaving strikers out and bringing him in and, and rotating like that. As soon as he got injured, that stopped being the case. And also, as we know, they play a very physical style, so to have to produce that, the same players to have to produce that every three days is difficult. And they're coming towards the end of the cycle and their players are kind of not improving anymore, most of them. They're kind of 28, 29, the point where... You might, the best you can hope for is a plateau. So you put all those things together. And also, I know people laugh at Liverpool saying that they're affected by the absence of the crowd. It's not because the Anfield crowd is so dangerous and so intimidating and so terrifying and all of that nonsense. It's that certain clubs, certain particular styles of team feed off crowd action more and crowd noise more than players do. But Manchester City play quite a bloodless style and the Etihad is not, renowned for its noise so they're able to i think they've handled playing without play for playing without crowds better whereas liverpool do feed off the crowd because their style is that very energetic style and anything you can get to ramp up that intensity in the players and in, and in the team is is worth something and they've also been without that and if you add up all those things i mean ultimately it'll always still be about not playing well enough but there have been a lot of factors that are very specific and are unique to this season that have affected Liverpool and they won't exist next season. I do think they need a couple of buys and who knows whether without Champions League football and maybe without European football at all, those that those funds will be afforded to Jurgen Klopp. But if he gets them and assuming he stays, I would definitely expect Liverpool to challenge for the title next season. That's interesting. We had Simon Hughes from the Athletic on yesterday and he just dropped into conversation that it was his understanding last summer they were about to realise about 60 million, or certainly their plans were to realise about 60 million by selling three players, one of whom would have been Origi and uh, a couple of others, um, a Shakiri, and, and I can't even remember who the third one was now at this point. But th- that didn't happen because there was nobody, there was no Bournemouth willing to spend 18 million on one of their subs uh, <laughs> all of a sudden. Um, and that prevented them from getting the reinforcements that they needed in case there was a rainy day and then there was a monsoon. It, 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 that's the, the economics that kind of leach out over you know, six months after it happens that we don't really fully understand. And certainly it's not an issue ever really for Man City or it's not an issue, it certainly wasn't an issue last year even for Chelsea and it's not going to be an issue for PSG as well. And, and that's where the, um, the club ownership issues become most really into sharp relief. That, that's the future here. That the, the um, su- yeah, the I mean, clubs Liverpool's are gonna... owners want to take money out. They don't want to put money in. And they put some money in, in that they, they allowed Klopp to buy Allison and they allowed him to buy Van Dyke. I mean, they, that squad wasn't cobbled together for nothing. Um, it was like there was, there was some fantastic buys in there, and they had an unbelievable run of hitting with almost every signing. Now, to reproduce that is asking a lot because that is unusual. I mean, it's almost unprecedented in the history of football how well they did with those consecutive signings around that time. And to do that again is, yeah, I mean, it, it would it would be surprising because it's just so it's just so unusual. Um, and yet, yeah, the, the owners aren't there to, they're not sugar daddies, they're not there to launder, the, nor launder reputations, they're not there to launder money, they're there to take money out. And to say that yet yeah, they couldn't buy players because they didn't sell those players that you mentioned is true, but ultimately it's only part of the truth because they are rich enough to put money in, they just don't want to. 
and they chose not to, but they could have done. And you see it, you, see, you saw it with United actually when they won the treble um, that that summer. They signed Mark Bosnich on a free. They sort of, I think they added Mikel Silvestre and uh, a little bit later, uh, Massimo Taibi. But they didn't strengthen when they were on top. And although they were able to still eke out two more league titles with the genius of Alex Ferguson and the unbelievable players that they already had, they didn't get that close in Europe again because you need to strengthen when you're on top. And that's that's how that's the best way of doing it. And Liverpool opted not to do that. Um, and I mean, I, I, I'm sure Jurgen Klopp wanted to do that. And he must have known that, you. I mean, just to always add at least something significant keeps it fresh. And I guess they, they did add Thiago, but... It felt always like they were adding Thiago because he was cheap. Uh, he didn't really seem like the player that they needed. And it was actually, I mean, again, it was extreme. I don't want to compare everything to Man United. And I'm sure I'd get people in my Twitter ads if I was still allowed on Twitter saying, saying oh, blah, 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 United this, United that. But it is really very similar to when United signed Veron because United at that point needed a lock picker. They needed a number 10. And instead, they signed a brilliant number six. Um, and that's what Liverpool did with Thiago. And Liverpool's problem throughout this not problem. I mean, it's problem. I use that in an advised sense because they haven't had that many problems. They finished second in the league. They won the league. They won the Champions League. But the thing that when you looked at that squad, you saw that they didn't quite have was they lacked a bit of guard and a little bit of creativity in midfield. And that's why I say it's a lot. The Klopp tried to sign Fekir and he couldn't. And then they ended up signing Thiago. But Thiago's not really the kind of player who's going who's gonna to pick things out around the box. He's not going to score. He's not going to contribute very many goals. And what Liverpool needed was number 10. And that was the same as United when they signed Van Nistelrooy because they wanted a proper world-class centre forward. But they also signed Varane. And what Varane wanted to do was Varane wanted to take the ball off the back four and went to spray passes around. But they already had Roy Keane doing that. And what they really needed was someone who could play on the half turn, someone who was able to beat men and pick those passes on the edge of the box. And they didn't, they didn't buy that. And that's, that's what's happened with Thiago, I think, who I'm absolutely certain will play better um, if in a midfield with, um, if he's able to play in midfield with Henderson and Fabinho or Fabinho and Wijnaldum, um, I'm sure they'll start to get more out of Thiago. But ultimately, I don't really think he was the player that they need. They, that they needed, they signed him because he was good and he was cheap, but that still doesn't make him right. Danny Lee were on with us a couple of weeks ago talking about your hazy slash uh, exciting memories from Milan uh, back in the day. <laughs> uh, there's, there's been a lot uh, written this week about that 2007 clash uh, like i mean th this might not be on that level but it's, who knows what could happen over the next couple of weeks uh, in terms of where the two clubs have gone it does seem like manchester united this is going to be a stepping stone this is going to be their last season in the europa league uh, for quite some time at the same time i presume manchester united fans would love to win this trophy um yeah i mean i'd love to win any trophy um better united i should be better united sides than this one have played in the europa league but um it's fair to say, but I guess only when they got booted out of the Champions League uh, first, rather like these guys. Um, my Milan experience was actually 2010. The one in 2007 uh, feels like, to me, as a United supporter now, I'm talking, in my top probably two of European Cups that United should have won that, that got away. The general narrative around that has been United were just outplayed by Kaká and, and Gattuso and Pirlo and, um, and Seydorf, but... It's not exactly like that. What actually happened, I thought that season, I still think that season, United were the best team in Europe. But by the time that Milan tie came, because they had that more of a Liverpool situation, um, they only had really 11 or 12 players. Uh, they were exhausted by the time that tie came around. And Ferdinand and Vidic missed the home leg. United were one up in the home leg. And then I think Hines and Brown banged into each other. There was, and Milan basically scored their two goals not because Kaká was unbelievable, although Kaká was an unbelievable player. I'm not trying, not trying to denigrate him at all and say that he wasn't. Um, but Milan won that tie because United didn't have a defence in the first leg. Um, and then by the time the second leg came, I think Vidic maybe played but wasn't fit. And um, they, yeah, they got they got battered in that first leg, in that second leg. But if they'd have had Vidic a fit, Vidic and Ferdinand for the first leg, it wouldn't have gone down like that. They didn't, and that means Milan deserved to beat them, and Milan were better than them. I'm not saying that that wasn't the case. But, um, yeah, there was, that wasn't the, the undressing that is commonly held to be the case. Anyhow, tonight, um, it's, a, it's a difficult one for United, actually, because Milan haven't got a lot of players, and United don't have a lot of players, and United also have a hard game at the weekend. They've got to play West Ham at home, and were they to win that West Ham game the way that other fixtures were, they'd probably be quite a long way of the way to 
to be getting into to be close and to be sure or getting close to sure of the top four. And at that point, then the cup games become the biggest games for for Solskjaer, who I'm sure his ultimate brief is getting the top four and then worry about the rest afterwards. Um, which is definitely what we saw at the end of last season when they rested players for the Chelsea Cup semi-final. Um, it should still, I mean, United Milan still, you just hear the names and you kind of get the adrenaline pumping, even if it isn't the best level of United and Milan. Um, I think that United will probably be feeling pretty good about themselves after what they did, after what they did at the weekend, because what they did at the weekend was they produced not just, they didn't just win at, at Man City, but they produced a proper performance where you can watch it and you can look at every aspect of that performance and say that is the performance of a proper team, of a team that knows what it was doing, the, the way that they the way that they pressed, the way that they coordinated the press, the way that they counter-pressed, the way that they attacked, the way that they dominated the ball when things were going their way in the game. I mean, it, it, was, it was great. Well, I mean, and whether they can produce that again, because they're going to need to produce something good at the weekend as well, and whether they make any changes to this one because there will be players I'm sure they Ole Solskjaer would like to rest I'm sure he would prefer to give Luke Shaw a rest I'm sure he'd prefer to give Bruno Fernandes a rest I mean that won't happen Rashford's injured so it will probably be more or less the same team and then probably more or less the same team again at the weekend with perhaps Rashford or Cavani involved I mean that team should be too good for Milan who aren't particularly good even at full strength and don't have anything like full strength available so you would expect them to go to San Siro with an advantage, but you have to earn it. I mean, United have lost to way, way worse teams than Milan this season, and uh, Milan will come to United expecting to get a result. Does the manner of the victory on Sunday, Daniel, give you just a little bit of extra hope that they can win this sort of competition, that with a specific set of challenges against a specific opposition, Solskjaer is underrated as a manager in terms of actually figuring those things out? Um, I think United. I mean, I think United are the best team in this competition. It doesn't mean they, they'll win the competition because it's cup competition, and there are absolutely loads of teams still left that could beat them. They could lose to Arsenal. They could lose to Tottenham, and that's just the English teams. Um, so you you can never rely on winning a cup competition, um, and they're not so good at this point that you would just assume that they're going to beat teams who are a bit less good than they are because constantly seen them losing to teams who are a lot less good than they are but they will know that they're the best team in this competition and they will expect themselves to win this competition they should have won it last season one of the best performances under Solskjaer was the first hour against Sevilla but the things that cost them and the things that keep costing them is the inability to finish ruthlessly and they don't have really a ruthless finisher in the team I mean perhaps Cavani but um, he, he he hasn't really he has met, he scored some great goals he scored some great goals at good times but he's not He's not a level the finisher of the, the guys who you see. Like he's not a Haaland or an Mbappe level the finisher who, if you're playing against their team, you expect them to score at some point. He's not he's not as good as they are. So the defending has improved a lot recently, but that doesn't mean that you feel that you're clear of the defensive balls ups that just turn up here because they've been going on for so long. So although Maguire's playing, I thought Maguire against uh, City, that was one of the best games he's had for United. And wan has played, played much better recently. And obviously Luke Shaw's now a good player, amazingly. So they are defending better, but that doesn't mean that you would assume that they're not going to make any kind of uh, ricket um, at a crucial moment, just as you, you're not going to assume that you're going to get ruthless finishing out of Anthony Martial in a semi-final or a final. So the things that need to be in place for you to be sure that a team are going to win big games, I don't think United still have, but they do have the best individuals probably of, or at least as good, the most good individuals of te- of any team that's left. And they are, they are the best team of, of, of what's left, but they're not the best team by enough and they're not a good enough team by enough for anyone to assume that they're going to win anything. Daniel, good stuff. Enjoy the game tonight. Cheers. You too. I'll see you again. Bye. Daniel Harris giving us his thoughts on United Milan tonight. We'll obviously be talking about it on the show tomorrow and we'll be keeping you up to date on it across off the ball on News Talk tonight as well. It is 8.34 this morning here on OTBAM, OTBM live in association with Gillette. Good morning, Star with Gillette, giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. The League of Ireland season gets underway tomorrow night. Shamrock Rovers take on Dundalk in the President's Cup. Owen has been speaking to the new director of the League of Ireland, Mark Scanlon, ahead of the new season. 
OK, so the 2021 League of Ireland season is here. The President's Cup between Shamrock Rovers and Dundalk takes place on Friday. And that, of course, is followed by a full series of Premier Division games a week later. The season was launched this morning. And as part of that, we are joined by League of Ireland director Mark Scanlon. Uh, Mark, good morning. Good morning, all. Let's get straight into the big story of the last 24 hours. The, the situation at Dundalk has grabbed a lot of headlines it seems there's a bit of uncertainty about who their manager is. What's your understanding about what's going on here? Yeah, no, it's, it's very clear from our side, really. Uh, the clubs, as part of the club licensing process, have to submit uh, mandated persons in, in a number of roles. And along with that, there's qualifications that need to be in place. So uh, Shane Keegan was submitted as, as the manager of Dundalk. And uh, it's quite clear for us what the situation is. Right, so it did seem from the press conference yesterday as if he wasn't fully sure that he was going to be manager or that the club weren't fully sure. But from your perspective, Shane Keegan is manager and, and uh, Filippo is just a coach. Yeah, that's right, Jeff. Filippo and Giuseppe are, are coaches there and uh, Shane is the manager and uh, Jim has obviously come in as the sporting director there as well. So, you know, there's a lot of experience and uh, coaching knowledge and qualification in the club and we wish them the best of luck this season. Is there a sense that it's going to be a managerial collective there that after the slap in the wrist financially from the UEFA situation last year that they've had to move their cards around a little bit? I think really that's an internal matter for the, for the club in terms of the coaching arrangements. I mean, uh, clubs now have, have a lot more complex situations now in, in terms of uh, coaching scenarios than maybe it used to be. It's not always as straightforward as just a, a manager and assistant manager as it was in the past. So uh, clubs, whether here or across Europe, have, have different roles as uh, head coaches, sporting directors, technical directors and so on. So, um, you know, how they organise that internally within the dock or, or any other club within the league really is, is a matter for the club. But uh, as far as the, the club license and process is concerned and that's here on the domestic licensing and, and also on the UEFA licensing uh, the mandated person of, of who the, the manager is itself uh, is, is somebody with a pro license qualification and uh, Shane is obviously uh, the manager What was the situation last year that Filippo Giovagnoli seemed to be manager was, was there a way around that or, or, or what was the situation uh, well, what happens initially when uh, a club changes uh, managerial appointment is is they then have 60 days uh, to find a replacement within that as well. So there's always that window where by uh, when the club decides to change manager, either whether a manager has left or, uh, or a manager is sacked by a club, that there's an interim period. So uh, Filippo would have came in, in in that role in the meantime and then uh, that grace period uh, is now up. So uh, as part of the submission for this year's club licence and then it has to be a pro licence coach. Right, that, that makes sense. Um, Mark, this is your first full season in this role. It's a tough time to be starting any new gig, I'd imagine. But at the same time, it's a time where plenty of change is going to happen over the next few months. Does that give you a little bit of help knowing that things are going to change? And maybe if you want to change things, it's going to naturally happen anyway over the next little while? Yeah, I think, I, you know, I knew when I came into the role last July that, that we had a, a tough job in our hands um, coming in in the middle of a, a pandemic at the time. But, um, you know, we were very confident that there's significant support here in the association at board level uh, with our new chief executive since Jonathan Hill has come on board as well. Uh, we have a lot of new staff come into the department as well in, in various different roles. Um, so, you know, it's given us a, a lot of hope for the future in terms of building. Um, right now, obviously, we still have the difficulties of the COVID-19 pandemic and with fans still out of stadiums, it's, it's been increasingly difficult for clubs, uh, obviously, to uh, organise their, their financial affairs in particular with the lack of gate receipts and revenue. But um, I think actually the, the challenges that we faced in, in the last six months uh, both as an association, the league itself, and then the clubs in general, uh, has actually brought us closer together in terms of the collaboration and the work that's been done because uh, everybody has been very much in this together to try to get through the pandemic to finish last season, which uh, thankfully we successfully done, uh, and to get us up and running ahead of the start of the new season. So I think there's a real air of excitement, optimism and enthusiasm from, from everybody at the minute. I do want to chat about how you view the league going post-pandemic, post-vaccine, but for the time being the relationship between the fans and the league is going to be through online streaming, through television matches, through Watch LOI. Uh, is there any early signs of how successful Watch LOI might be this season? 
I think, um, you know, last season there was a lot said about Watch LOI and whether it was success and people were trying to focus on subscription numbers. But I, I think what we found is, is the, the primary service uh, last year was to make sure that the loyal fans uh, stayed engaged, particularly those who had purchased season tickets uh, pre the pandemic, uh, and to make sure that their, their clubs were able to provide football for them in the, in the short period of time that that had to be organised. And I think that was a, was a real success. And I think what was uh, overlooked a lot of time was not necessarily the subscription figures, but the viewing figures you know there was a lot of times where there was four and five season ticket holders within a household who would have sat down then on a Friday night a Saturday night or a Sunday and, and, and watch games whether it was their own club or somebody else so um, you know I think two of the things that it showed us last year is number one how important it is to have the fans in the grounds and in the stadiums and as, as great as it has been to have the games up and running it's certainly not the same without the fans and everybody looks forward to the fans returning but secondly I think it's shown how uh, loyal uh, much of a loyal fan base we have within League of Ireland football and how important the clubs are to to a lot of people on a weekly basis and, and they stay engaged uh, they watch the live streams they certainly engage with social media content both from the league channels and, and through the club channels as well and um, you know whether it's been podcasts or shows like your own as well that have uh, you know brought coverage to the league as well there's been significant engagement and I think that uh, provides us with a lot of hope for the future that not only will we keep the, the current fans engaged but uh, that we can bring the league to a wider audience as well. So the figures that came out from last season, it was 11,000 paying customers for the service. Now this year, you're looking for a 15% increase in subscription, I think, plus a marketing budget of, of a sizable amount for this year. So, so what is the plan to use that budget to get to that 15% increase? Yeah, well, we, we uh, launched Watch LOI yesterday officially for, for customers now to uh, be able to come on and purchase the uh, season pass, the half-season pass, which, which brings us to the mid-season break at the end of May. Um, so, you know, we, we'll see a, a marketing campaign behind that from ourselves as a league over the next couple of weeks throughout uh, social media channels in particular uh, to engage with that audience who are online and, and interested in watching the streams. Um, but I think the real success of it will be uh, down at club level as well, where the clubs have really got involved uh, in, in promoting it to their own season ticket holders as well and their own fan base. And uh, yeah, we're quite confident that we'll see an increase in the subscription figures this year and that we'll see more people uh, being engaged and watching it as well. But, uh, you know, we have LOI TV across the First Division and the Women's National League as well. So uh, it's a much broader range of streaming service that we'd be providing this year uh, whereas last year was obviously primarily focused on on the Premier Division the First Division club's done a great job of, of trying to bring their own home games to their own fans as well uh, and we've just tried to put that all into uh, a league platform this year where everything is uh, under a similar brand and in the one place for fans to make it easy for, for people to find and become familiar with so uh, hopefully it'll, the, the, the subscription numbers will grow throughout the season and we're certainly urging as, as many fans as possible to get behind it, supporting their own club. You know, the revenue uh, from all the subscriptions goes directly uh, to the clubs as well. So, you know, by, by fans purchasing the streaming package, they're directly supporting their own club. How disappointing was it that Soccer Republic has got pulled and that there won't be a highlight show on RTE on Monday nights? Yeah, the, the highlights have obviously been very important um, over the last... 10 to 15 years in Soccer Republic and uh, Monday Night Soccer before that was, was was certainly something I always enjoyed watching as a fan myself as well and engage with it, you know, hearing the views of, of the various different pundits as well uh, on a weekly basis, uh, dissecting the information uh, from the games and analysing the, uh, the performances. So, you know, it is something that we certainly uh, still look towards in the future, but increasingly over the last number of years, and I think, you know, RTE Sport have, have said in terms of the viewing numbers dropping off, fans are expecting... Uh, the immediate coverage straight away so they're looking for the goals on match nights and um, you know they want to see all the action as it's happening live so I think it's important for us to make sure that uh, with the streaming services now being provided that that we can provide more content immediately on match nights as well uh, the clubs have consistently said to us that they want to be able to put highlights out through their own channels uh, the following day after a game as well so you know that's a, another complication when uh, we need to wait till till Monday night for highlight shows as well so I think um, we will have a significant amount of social content this year so it will be on demand for fans and uh, reviewing what we do in terms of an overall highlights package for the league on a weekly basis is something we're still uh, very much looking into and uh, it's not something I would say is now gone forever it's just something that's not part of the, the current RTE broadcasting deal for this year. Can we talk a little bit about what happens post-vaccine then and if we get to a situation in the next year or two where you know you can have full stadiums, uh, what are your plans? Have you, have you got ideas? Have you got targets that you want to hit once 
people are streaming back into the grounds around Ireland? Yeah, I think um, you know we, we we have our own internal targets certainly in in areas that we'd like to improve uh, within the clubs, and certainly one of them when when we talk about grounds is improving the facilities across the country. Uh, I think that's key important point for for attracting new supporters and a new fan base as well uh, to make sure that we can open the league up to a wider audience. You know, we'd like to see more families attend. We'd like to see more young kids, boys and girls attending. Um, the, the men's leagues and the women's national league as well as we try to, to grow the audience. So so that's something that we'll certainly be focusing on uh, post-pandemic and uh, hopefully when, when vaccinations have been fully rolled out, we can see fans back in stadiums. But uh, there are a number of other areas that we want to work on on helping the clubs develop as well. We certainly want to uh, see a bigger increase in terms of, of clubs' involvement with underage football. Uh, the academy structures have been grown quite strong across a number of clubs and we want to be able to support uh, the clubs, in, in terms of that growth, uh, there's been significant amount of work put in by the clubs uh, over the last number of years to, to have teams in the underage national leagues. Uh, we want to help the clubs in terms of their community development as well. We've seen some really good examples of uh, clubs over the last few years and how they've engaged with their local community, uh, different programs you know, out, outside of the actual football side to make sure that they, again, broaden the fan base and speak to a wider audience as well. So. Uh, areas like that are, are things that we want to focus on and become much more of a, a service provider for the clubs where we're actually helping them grow and develop as opposed to just organising the competitions and, and the league itself. So uh, it's part of our, our wider plans and strategy. Can we chat about the facilities then? Because obviously it's something that a lot of League of Ireland fans mention as something that perhaps is holding back the league from taking off and from attracting new supporters from coming to the grounds that perhaps need a lot of work done on it. When you talk about this big picture, how much government support, how much funding is going to be required for wide-scale improvements when it comes to facilities in the league? I think it's no secret, really, that the, you know the facilities aren't really what we would uh, we would like them to be. I mean, we certainly uh, would like to have a, a minimum standard of facilities that all the clubs in the league at least meet uh, the UEFA criteria for uh, hosting games if they qualify for European competition. That we don't have a situation where where clubs are maybe having to look at a, a different ground to be able to play in European competition and so on. So uh, that does take significant investment, and it does take time, obviously, to develop facilities. It's not something that we we will be able to to do overnight, but uh, the best examples that we have seen so far certainly have been where there's been collaboration, uh, whether it's with the clubs, ourselves, government, uh, or local authorities and within the area as well. A number of county councils uh, have invested and, and been involved in grounds at League of Ireland level, and it's been hugely successful because I think the, the key to it is uh, investment into the grounds, that they're a multi-purpose community facility as well. And, you know, it's not just that it's, it's exclusively for a League of Ireland club. We've seen really good examples where uh, clubs have been able to use the grounds then uh, you know, for, for various different events, whether it's things like concerts that uh, is a possibility for, for clubs to be able to host or whether it's uh, wider community events that, that can be involved in the stadium. Um, if, if the design is appropriate in the first place, conferences, meeting rooms, uh, everything else that, that can go with that. So it's something that's very much our, on our agenda as an association and, and something that we want to work closely with government, local authorities and the clubs in developing. When you see the government get so strongly behind this World Cup 2030 bid, last week. Does that give you hope that they care about football or does it have the opposite effect entirely? Yeah, I think, look, the, the World Cup bid is, is, is certainly very much at feasibility stage at the minute, but I think it, it, it shows uh, the ambition of government to, to uh to be able to bid for major tournaments like this or to be involved in the bidding process. And, you know, we've seen that we've we done that successfully with the uh, Europa League back in 2011 and we've seen it with the, the Euro 2020 bid. Obviously, you know, disappointing that, that the Euros didn't take place in the country last year. Hopefully they will this year. But I think government have, have supported all their initiatives and um, I think uh, we'll get significant support as, as we look to try to develop the infrastructure across the league as well. Does it sometimes feel, though, that the government are very quick to get behind these blue ribbon ideas where it will obviously be something that the entire country is talking about rather than paying enough attention to investment in grounds like League of Ireland that may not get national and international headlines but may have better long-term effects for children and for the, the actual adult players in the league at the moment. No, I think they're, they're two different things, really. I mean, the, the international bids like that have a much uh, wider scope as well across, you know, fans coming into the, to the country as well, uh, an increase in, in terms of area like tourism and so on as well that the government look at, it, um, you know, as a, as a wider bid. But, you know, we've seen great support uh, for any of the funding applications that have come in for, for stadiums across the country, the sports capital grants applications. 
uh, received a record number of, of uh, football applications, as, as you may have seen yesterday on our social media channels and our facilities department and, and uh, Walter Holleran, who looks after that, that area for us, has done a huge amount of work engaging with clubs, both League of Ireland clubs and grassroots clubs. And uh, it's certainly something that we want to continue to improve as the facilities. And, and I think there's a huge amount of support out there at government level and at local authority level for that to happen. Where do you stand on the All Ireland League? Is is this something you're in favour of, and and where is this at the moment in terms of discussions? Yeah, well, I think uh, the, the clubs have made it clear last year that they certainly wanted us to engage uh, with the IFA. Obviously, there's a, a number of other uh, considerations around that as well. I mean, currently, uh, at league level, it's not permitted, as you know, within uh, UEFA competitions that, that we can uh, just join up and, and have a league. But it's certainly ongoing discussions that uh, we're continue to be committed to. And uh, we, we'll sit around the table and have any of them discussions that uh, we feel is within the best interest of the clubs and the best interest of the league going forward. But, uh, you know, any of the, the previous All-Ireland competitions that have been placed, uh, I think we're very positive. It's good to have that variety within our games as well. Competitions like the Satanta Cup in the past, um, you know, provided a different element to our fans as well and an excitement for, for games as well. So uh, we're very open to, to any competitions that we feel will help improve uh, the clubs, bring a commercial value to, to the league as well and um, hopefully again open it up to a wider audience. So, so it's something we'll continue to explore. Is your feeling that the structures that have been put forward by the likes of Kieran Lucid, that they will be positive for the clubs in the league? Yeah, I think, look, there's been various different structures and, and ideas put out there. Uh, you know, clubs have, have spoken to me quite regularly over the last few months in terms of some of their own ideas and tweaks and that as well. And as I said, I think it's something that's ongoing right now. Uh, the focus during the pandemic is obviously on, on the current season. Um, you know, last year we didn't have uh, much time to really elaborate on them discussions because the focus was on, on, on finishing the season. So I think we're in a, a really good place ahead of our own uh, domestic season now at the minute. And, and that's the main focus at this moment of time. But uh, the wider discussions for, for development of the league, I think, uh, I don't think we'd rule anything in or anything out at this point. And, and we're certainly open to discussions. Is the sense from north of the border that they're also open to discussion? Because it did seem as if they were very reluctant to engage for, for a period of time at least. Yeah, I think, look, the, again, the, the, the uh, clubs that are playing in uh, the Northern Ireland Football League as well have, have made it clear that they'd like to uh, see some discussions happen as well. So I think broadly across the board, uh, I think everybody's... Uh, Keeping, keeping their options open and, and certainly, as I said, not ruling anything in or out. And I think it's something that, that will crop up over the next couple of years as we uh, continue to have them discussions. But right now, the focus is on, on the current season. OCB AM. Okay, it's 8.51 this morning. If you want to get in touch, if you have any views on the uh, League of Ireland, we'd love to hear from you as well this morning. 0879-180-180 is the number. A reminder, OTBAM is live in association with Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette, giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. John Duggan is with us. John, how are you? Ger and Owen, how are you getting on? You're writing about the... Um, it, there's nothing worse than comparing yourself with your neighbour when your neighbour is like a super sore away success and you yourself are, you know, struggling. And yet, it's Ireland. What would you be doing but comparing yourself with your neighbour, John? Uh, well, the neighbour drives a Ferrari in this case, and uh, I drive a Lada. And that is the Clare and Limerick situation. And I'm just in the column this week, just threading through that things can change for the better, but it takes years for that to happen. And I never would have thought in my wildest dreams as a Clare Hurling fan that Limerick, of all counties, would be the supreme uh, county of the land. Um, I saw so many disappointments from Limerick 94, 96. I was at that semi final in 2009 when they were beaten by 24 points by Tipperary, the Nadir of Limerick Hurling. And obviously, JP McManus has been a great uh, benefactor for Limerick, but they did get their act together at all levels at schools level, or work school reach, at, at colleges, if it's, if it's given cup level, at under 21 at minor. But the key thing was the academy that they brought in a, a decade ago from under 14s onwards, the likes of Anthony Daly, a Clare man coaching there in that academy and they're, they're now seeing it with the with the likes of Garrett Hegarty, Kean Lynch, uh, you know, all these top players that Limerick have, uh, Kyle Hayes and uh, they are going for a third All-Ireland in four years while Clare, there seems to be a lot of infighting at the moment, questions about the lack of funding that they have for their hurling team and uh, just a general air of uh, discontentment and I'm just uh, arguing in the column sort it out, lads, because otherwise you could be facing it 10 years of looking across the Shannon with a lot of envy at Limerick. Yeah, it's hard to sort out. Um, civil wars are the hardest of all wars to negotiate your way through. They are, and that's why um, 
you just look to your neighbour, they had a really, really bitter civil war between Justin McCarthy and the players in 2010 when Justin um, decided to let, let a lot of the players go. Then other players joined in solidarity with their teammates. Over 20 players uh, left the Limerick setup, And some players like Graham Mulcahy, who was a future All-Ireland winner, came into the scene. Um, but it took Limerick a long time from Don Grady, from TJ Ryan to John Allen uh, to, to, to get out of that. And the key man was John Kiley to, to copper fasten the glue of, of getting Limerick back to where they should be. In an amateur sport, it can happen, but you have to have your structures right. Like Clare have nearly spent five million on a centre of excellence where the pitch was not usable last year for the senior hurlers. And that's not good. Um, committees from county boards, an independent committee now, a lot of uh, smoke filled room politics that needs to be just completely cleared out. If so many um, players from the 90s and all that that can that can lend their expertise to coaching young players and bringing Claire on, you don't need multi billionaires to be able to help you. Like Kerry County Board went to the States five or six years ago and raised over a million uh, for the benefit of Kerry, the GAA. So I think fundraising can happen. There's a lot of smart people in Clare and they just need to harness that because they're not doing that right now. The, the, the bitterness that we've seen emerging over the last, and it's been brewing for obviously years and years at this point, um, it, it is very hard to see a way through. And yet at the same time, you know, if, if a resolution is reached where a, a proper uh, agreement and a, a clarity of purpose emerges from that, then, you know, it, I guess the point I'm trying to make is here, there are definitely some people who feel that they have right on their side and what they're trying to do is for the benefit of the future of Clare Hurling and, and you'd have to argue the, the whole uh, GA community. But then there are clearly just some factions who believe they're only in it for uh, the opposite ego. And until the ego disappears, until this becomes not about personalities, but what about the shared vision for the future is, nothing's going to happen. And that's, we've seen that in every sporting organisation in the country. People take their sport unbelievably seriously. They take the power that comes with sport more seriously and they, they uh, that that's a toxic mixture sometimes. GA politics can be harder to negotiate than being in a political party. And GA politics can be at times very, very corrosive. We've seen in Cork and Limerick, as I just referred to there, how it can work against the county's interests and the, all the interest. The only interest of the fans should be the performance of the hurling and football teams. Um, but you do have, need people to administrate that. Um, I think it is helpful and useful that that era oak motion uh, for an independent committee to review all of the structures in Clare, the finance, the governance, um, the hurling and the football development squads, uh, will bring those these uh, independent people on board. The worry is that this could get watered down, and I hope it doesn't, and I hope by the end of the year there'll be a clear pathway for Clare, because, as I said, it takes years for these players that uh, are leading Limerick now to absolute brilliant glory to come through, but the, the, I haven't heard in the last 10 years of ructions and issues in Limerick because they've sorted them out. So the more the, the, the time keeps ticking, the harder it is for you to, to get to where you need to get to. And uh, that's the worry. And that, that's why um, the, 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 the dreaded human beings, I would call it, that get in the way of these things need to get out of the way. I guess part of what Limerick have done really well over the last couple of years is actually ensuring that all their own resources were maximised. I'm sure they were looking at the Ferrari next door when Paul Canark was helping Claire back in the day and bringing Claire to great success and actually realizing, hold on a minute, he's one of our own. We need to ensure that he's working for us. Uh, it was probably something that they did. That, of course, the money was important and it continues to be important. The, the Limerick Academy is, by all accounts, absolutely fantastic and, and has, has had so many of these people picking hurling, for example, over rugby in, in, in many cases, but actually smart thinking and common sense has got them a whole distance as well. Well, I wrote that in the, ar in the article that he is a symbol of, of, of what's happened uh, in a role reversal across the Shannon. And also, as you said, like Limerick has always been to me and my mother's from Limerick. Um, my late dad was from Clare, was a rugby city, Gary Owen, Young Munster, uh, all Crescent. They appear to have won four Munster clubs in the last decade. Uh, and they've won an All-Ireland club, Shane Dowling, the biggest uh, uh, symbol of that. Uh, Ballier won one Munster club for Clare. And you do see all these things knitted together. The schools, the colleges, the clubs. In the 90s, you had Joseph Dura Bearfield, you had Six Mile Bridge, uh, you'd win an All-Ireland, you'd Wolf Tones in an All-Ireland final. 
uh, maybe these things go in waves, but you need to be able to give yourself the best possible chance. And I don't think Clare as a county are giving themselves the best possible chance right now because of the messing that's going on. Does it fr frustrate you as a Clare hurling supporter to think that this might actually be a golden generation or this has been a golden generation and the end product might be won All-Ireland? And that was right at the start of the golden generation. Uh, well, I think the golden generation's gone. I think like Tony Kelly is is obviously still there and he's doing brilliantly, but no, that's gone. The, 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 it was 2012 to 2014. That has moved on. We saw that with Limerick. And like again, in Limerick between 2000 and 2002, if I'm right, won three All-Ireland under 21s in a row. They never capitalized on that. They never harnessed that. And sometimes it's easy to say, now Limerick have won the last two minor uh, titles in Munster, that there'll be a, an automatic progression. The 1997 Clare All-Ireland winning team didn't really have any, apart from John Redden, um, they didn't really have any players coming through uh, into into senior level. So sometimes it doesn't translate, but I do think that, that generation, as you call it, that I, I thought would actually replace Kilkenny. I thought Clare would win three to four to five All-Irelands after that 2013 success because it's such a young team. Uh, they won the under 21 that year. Tony Kelly was the young player and the player of the year. Hasn't happened. Um, and I think that if you're looking down 2021 at structural issues in the county, you can't have a situation in 2031 where Clare are, are, have become another Cork. And, I, 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 and I'm really hoping that Cork come out of their slumber. Cork are, what, 16 years without All-Ireland this year, that you'd hope that... Um, I'm, just seeing, I'm just seeing the problems ahead. And when I'm looking to Limerick, I'm seeing no problems there at all. That, that got a rise mile from Owen. Any, any subtle accidental dig, a bit of shrapnel that the Cork fans picked up this morning, Owen's right behind that. He's, uh, he's reveling in that. Yeah. I, th I think it's just a. It, it is always funny that the footballers in Cork have won an All Ireland more recently than the hurlers. That's like a. That, it's it's more to do with the the football man inside me rather than than anything else rather than the anti Cork. Uh, um, I, I think it's very easy for that for that scenario that you outlined there, the the grim scenario to to happen because factions exist and unless some piece is brokered that everybody can actually get behind. And as I say, park the egos, then uh, nothing's going to happen. Uh, but the alternative is that actually structures aren't that difficult to get right. You could easily talk to your friends in Limerick. You could easily come up to Dublin and see what uh, they've been doing at underage level to increase their participation levels. And ultimately, the GA is about a, it, it is a participation organisation. There are elite teams at the very top, and those elite teams play, play in the competitions that raise loads of money and that we all want to go and see. But the point of the GA clubs is to get kids playing and to keep them as active members of that club for as long as possible, so that they ultimately become mentors, administrators, referees, lines people, you know, the grounds people. Like that's that's what the organisation is supposed to be. And um, you know, if you're fighting over uh, whatever it is that they're all fighting over, then you've kind of lost sight of why you got into this in the first place. Um, I well, don't, it's the most the most successful manager, Jer, in Dublin hurling history, in contemporary history, is Anthony Davy. Andy Daly has the blueprint. He has the inside track of what the academy was like in Limerick. He's a former Clare manager. He's a twice All-Ireland winning captain with Clare. Surely there's a place at the table to say, OK, Brian Lowen's running the team. Like, I'm just looking at Manchester United yesterday. I'm looking at John Mercer and I'm looking at uh, Darren Fletcher helping out Solskjaer and technical and football director roles. Why can't you have Anthony Daly involved? In, like, he might not want to, right? That's, that's fine. I don't know the ins and outs, right? But the, these are the kind of people you want to have in your structure in some way uh, as, as, as directors and centres and, and centres of excellence from a personnel point of view and human capital point of view to give yourself the best possible chance. Yeah, it's true. Um, and look, unfortunately, it has become a soap opera that uh, is very public and we keep getting more details and that's going to be the case, I think this is probably going to be fought out in the media as opposed to um, in an administration room where there is uh, some chat going on. What else has happened in the world of sport, John? Well, Liverpool into the quarterfinals of the Champions League, lads. Uh, that was comfortable last night. 2 0 win over Leipzig, 4 0 now over both legs. Uh, Ronaldo out yesterday, Messi out today. Um, it's now the Haaland and Bappe era, lads. Uh, one all draw, brilliant goal from uh, Messi, and then he missed a penalty, as Ozzy Ardiles said uh, when, when he uh, tweeted out that goal. This is football, not VAR, which I kind of agreed with. 5-2 uh, win for Man City over Southampton in the Premier League. Two goals from De Bruyne, two goals from Mares. Tonight in the Europa League, 5.55, Man United against uh, AC Milan at Old Trafford. No Zlatan, he's injured. 
uh, Cavani, uh, Rashford and De Gea set to miss out for Manchester United, with Van der Beek also injured. Eight o'clock starts for Arsenal, Olympiacos and Spurs, Dinamo Zagreb. Um, we've got a bit of horse racing news. Rob James, that jockey who was uh, captured uh, mounting a deceased horse, has been given a four-month ban, a 12-month ban, suspended for eight months by the IHRB. Uh, Sam Bennett looking to regain the green jersey of the Paris Nice today, the fifth stage. And Rory McIlroy, lads, getting texts from Tiger Woods about his form. Got a bit of shade from Tiger. So Rory's lining up with the players today at Sawgrass. Remember, virtual insanity, you can check out the tips on the OTB app. Uh, so Rory's out at 12.40. Shane Larry out after 6. McDowell out just after 12 o'clock today. And Rory getting a bit of shade from Tiger. He texted me some words of encouragement before the final round of Bay Hill um, on Sunday. Yeah. And things didn't quite go to plan. Uh, and he was the first one to text me and, and be like, you know, what's what's going on here? So even from the hospital bed, he's still, he's still giving me some heat. It's... Uh... A uh, world that Rory McIlroy lives in now where he's on private jets and he's won four majors and he's no longer chipping balls into his washing machine. But it still must be pretty cool, guys, to get texts from Tiger Woods. Giving you giving you crap? Like, I'm not sure. It's like, oh, right, okay. You're punching down, Tiger. Thanks very much from your hospital bed. <laughs> I, I, I love the, the Rory Tiger Woods text message history, like the stuff that Rory used to talk about, about Tiger texting him at 3 o'clock in the morning saying, I'm doing push-ups, WBU, and Rory McIlroy would like, for God's sake, this guy's an absolute maniac. Uh, that there is a real sort of mentor-mentee relationship here between the two of them in a sort of uh, barb-filled way where Tiger would be like, look at me, I'm the ghost. Uh, you've got to up your game to, to stay along with me. Except we know now that Tiger's favourite nocturnal activity was not push-up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess this is this was only a couple of years ago he said this. This right. was, was okay. post-comeback. This is post-comeback, <laughs> Tiger. It would, it would the HPU is something that he, uh, he also used with other people. Uh, good stuff, John. Thanks very much for that. All right, lads. Five past day. nine this morning here on OTB AM. Here's what's uh, coming up on OTB Sports Radio between now and 10 o'clock for you. The Six Nations show is live at noon with guests Johnny Murphy and Johnny Beatty with Neil Tracy presenting. OTB Gold is Barry Ryan, The Ascent. Our History of Sport lecture series with Paul Rouse at three. Our retro panel, Telling It Like It Is, is four o'clock. I presume John Harson's on it. Uh, if he's not, he should be. OTB Gold is Ray Boom Boom Mancini, a classic of the genre at six o'clock. And then, obviously, Joe is back with the rest of the team from 7 o'clock tonight on Off The Ball on News Talk. Up next this morning on OTB AM, Tom Malone's final Cheltenham countdown. OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. Off The Ball. Jamie caught Frank with quite a bad challenge and the physio was patching him up and Les Seeley, his turn turned to Frank, he went, Frank, get back on and do him good and proper. He said he took the liberty there. He said, make sure you leave it on him good and proper. And I'm stood there, I'm thinking, oh, hang on. He's talking about him doing what's... This ain't right, you know? Off the ball. Weeknights from 7 and weekends from 1. This is OTB Sports Radio. Live 24-7 on the OTB Sports app. Get ready for the Cheltenham Festival with the Boyle Sports app. With a special offer guaranteed on every race every day of the festival, plus extra places on each way bets over all four days. The Boyle Sports app has got you covered. Need to study up? Check out our Racing Post insights or watch our exclusive video previews with Cheltenham Gold Cup winning jockey Robbie Power. The Cheltenham Festival on the faster than ever Boyle Sports app. Boyle Sports. This is betting. Gamble responsibly. See gamblingcare.ie. 18 plus. Sean, what's that thing going round the garden? That is my, uh, our new Husqvarna auto mower. Auto mower? Yeah, it's a robotic lawn mower from Husqvarna. Cuts the grass automatically, has GPS tracking and an app. Even works in the rain. Hmm. I just thought, why spend time cutting grass when I could spend it with the family? Great! You can put the dinner on, so... Ah, no can do, love. I have to paint the man cave. Husqvarna auto mower. Never mow again. Learn more at husqvarna.ie. OTB AM With Gillette, put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. Yeah, so, um, Murray Kinsler and others are reporting that Six Nations Rugby confirms completion of the £365 million sterling deal with CBC for a one-seventh share in Six Nations Rugby. Um, this is obviously a deal that we had expected. We wondered if CBC would um, maybe try and turn the screw given the COVID scenario, but it appears as if They've completed that deal at roughly, I think, fairly similar terms to what would have been um, in the mix before the uh, COVID crisis hit. 
and it is a, an important day for uh, all of the rugby unions because none of them are particularly uh, well flush with money at the moment but what it means is that you are almost certainly going to see a lot of uh, rugby moving behind the paywall particularly the Six Nations so what that means for how we'll all be consuming rugby next season and it will be next season uh, will be something that we come back to and tease out in the coming days definitely worth a conversation around that as well now Tom Malone is with us Tom good morning to you how are you? Hey Ger, how's it going? So, you alright? Enjoying the uh, return of kids in school and the like? Yeah, and uh, like a little bit of weather. And then just in case we were all getting a bit carried away, then the weather disappears again. But it looks, it looks, yeah. it looks nice out in the gallops where you are. Uh, yeah, no, it's actually quite nice. And to be fair, um, it looks like Cheltenham are going to have significantly better ground than we had last year, which uh, will be positive for many horses and I suppose uh, as a spectacle as well, you know, you do want these horses to run on slightly better ground. You don't really want it on, you know, thick, heavy ground. It's going to be weird enough with no crowds anyway, so uh, you, you want the ground to be pretty decent. Okay, so we now have five-day declarations for Tuesday. That's how close we are. We're breathing down the neck of Chatham at this point. Nothing too out of the ordinary, but we have an idea of what horses are going where. There were some, there were some potentials. Uh, we thought that we thought that Honeysuckle was going for the champion hurdle, but there was a possibility that she wouldn't. Yeah, there was a slight possibility because, I mean, you know, the, the thing with those markets, um, when you're kind of this far out, the, several horses will have multiple entries. So it was just good yesterday to just get it, like we thought it was going to happen. So it's just good to really see it confirmed that Honeysuckle is going to go for the champion herd. Look, she's favourite, but I mean, she's not super short. She's kind of a similar enough price for this year's champion herd as she was. Um, for last year's mayor's hurdle, you know, nine to four. So uh, it's pretty fascinating. Uh, we still have appreciated top in the market to, in the Supreme. That's kind of uh, cut up a little bit, but you're still going to get a decent um, a decent field in that. We had 18 stand yesterday. So um, that suggests it'll be a good deep field in that one. Um, you've got the Arkle as well. The big thing about the Arkle is that, you know, the big two or three have stood up. Yeah, we've got Shishkin and Energamine. Obviously, Shishkin still... Uh, warm water favourite for that, but Willie Mullins and Ergamine, he's obviously the big Irish hope in it, but there could be a fly in the ointment. All mankind is going to make this a very different test compared to what the other horses have seen thus far, so that's pretty fascinating as well. Okay, so some of the races uh, that we didn't get to mention in the last couple of weeks, the Ryanair Chase and the Stairs Hurdle, what's the crack with those? Yeah, well, the Ryanair Chase is kind of funny. I mean, we kind of heard a bit about uh, Michael O'Leary in the last couple of weeks, obviously, given he's a major owner with Gordon. And uh, he has, uh, you know, he's never actually, despite personally sponsoring, I mean, it carries the name Ryanair, but it doesn't actually come out of the Ryanair marketing budget. It's personally sponsored by Michael O'Leary. And uh, he's never actually won the race. You think of some of the brilliant horses he's run in it over the last couple of years, including the like of Don Cossack, who managed to get beaten in the race uh, before he actually won it. So it's probably last chance saloon for him, but he does, he's kind of stuck with the likes of Sam Crow and Battle Over Doyen, who are very much on that sort of retrieval missions for this race. So it's it looks really like a Willie Mullins carve up, whatever he wants to do. He's got the likes of Min and Alaho in this. So they're pretty strong at the top of the market and they look to have a, a warm water chance. But it's, it's very difficult to think uh, sort of, you know, nostalgically about Michael O'Leary's involvement in the sport of racing and, you know, have a have a sort of sympathetic ear for him. But, you know, even even us cold-hearted souls who, you know, don't particularly like maybe the experience you might get the, at the airline sometimes might like to see him win his own race. And, uh, I mean, if Sampro were to do it, that would be uh, quite the exceptional story given how many, uh, I mean, the horse has had as many lows as highs over the course of, of his career so far. Okay, so that's Ryanair Chase. What about the stairs hurdle? Yeah, the stairs hurdle is fascinating once again because obviously this time last year was just, I mean, it was a how far is Paisley Park going to win by situation. And then he obviously bombed on the day and Lisnagar Oscar came and won at a huge price. Um, this year we've also had Thyme Hill come in and become a really big player in that uh, in that division as well. So, um, like I said, a regular feature of the stairs hurdle is just a really warm order favourite coming back to to regain the crown, the likes of, you know, Big Bucks or Barracuda or the like over the years. So um, Paisley Park is going to have a fight in his hands to regain his crown. Um, and it's absolutely fascinating. Like I said, Time Hill and himself get into a battle the last day at Ascot when, I mean, Paisley Park just looked beaten all ends up and he just stayed and stayed and stayed on. Um, so that's going to be fascinating. Then, like I say, you've got the reigning champ, Liz Nagar Oscar in there, who's... Uh, 
come into this race slightly under the radar, but he had a nice uh, prep run as well. So that's kind of set that race up really nicely. So again, again it's kind of weird. I mean, we would bemoan the Ryanair and the Stairs hurdle as kind of almost not proper championship races because Ted Walsh used to say, well, who wants to breed a three-mile hurdler? Like, you know what I mean? Everyone wants a champion hurdler. So um, it's good to see that there's really good competition in these races that maybe don't have the you know historical prestige of champion hurdle champion chaser gold cup okay um there's a, a story about envoy ln and his groom getting to lead him up at cheltenham what's going on here yeah it's quite a nice little story i mean there's so much negativity come out of the, the gordon story obviously which is to be completely expected and you know a lot of people were concerned about the stable staff and the the, you know, the links and the, the love they have for the horses. So obviously Envoy Allen was moved to Henry de Bromhead's yard as part of that. But um, Henry de Bromhead has said that Shawnee Mann, who is Envoy Allen's groom, will get to lead her up. Uh, she will get to lead him up, rather, in the Marsh chase. So that's just going to be a, you know, it's a nice gesture by Henry to someone who's obviously very affected by a situation she was a completely innocent party to. So um, that's just a really nice touch you'd have to say by Henry de Bromhead and um, and Sheedley Park. It's worth pointing out as well that the Irish stable staff, they'll kind of have to live in their own little Irish stable staff bubble due to all of the, um, you know, the COVID restrictions that come into play just even to get across to the festival this year. Okay, so that's how it's working. They're going to keep the, uh, the British staff and the Irish staff separate. Yeah, there's going to be kind of a series of bubbles, you know, similar to kind of like, not completely similar to the NBA, but um, the, the, the Irish staff, they obviously all have to get their tests and stuff like that. They have to head over early. Um, and then when they get back over there, they have another test, I think, on, on the other side as well. And then the Irish staff all stay in a separate area from the British staff. So, as you say, it's a, it's a very different festival. It looks like a lot, of, a lot of work has gone into making sure it works and making sure it just goes ahead in the first place. So, um, yeah, the stable staff, uh, it'll be very different for them. Just they, like I said, they're going to have to live in there. There'll be an Irish stable staff bubble, a UK stable staff bubble, and uh, I think uh, even for the jockeys as well, it's not going to be it's not going to be straightforward. All right, and we should acknowledge that it's going to be a very very weird Cheltenham 2021. Sorry, yeah, I mean it's just going to be a, a completely different scenario, isn't it? I mean, just for punters, we we the, the thing about Cheltenham this time around, it's going to crept up on us a little bit, hasn't it? You know. Because obviously with that Gordon story last week, it just dominated kind of all of the discussion in horse racing sphere. And now here we are, you know, a week out, less than a week out from the Cheltenham Festival. And, you know, it's kind of dawning on people, well, we can't go to the pub. You can't, well, okay, you've taken your five days off or whatever, booked a bit of holiday leave. And, well, what are you going to do? The same thing as you've been doing all year long anyway. So, um, yeah, and, you know, no bookie shops open. I mean, maybe I'm in the minority who has a real soft spot for having a, a bet in a bookie shop. And, you know, that feeling of getting cash back over the counter. And if you do have a winner, just deciding to go to a restaurant in the evening. So uh, that's all going to be taken away. And, you know, the roar of the Supreme won't be there either. So uh, it's going to be a week where we just have to try and focus on what we do have and not try to worry too much on, on what we're missing out on. That's a good point. Are they, is, will there be fake crowd noise? I think there will be fake crowd noise and they will have like, uh, you know, there will be a parade ring MC as well, which they had at Leopardstown too. Kevin O'Ryan was doing that at Leopardstown. So he was calling winners back to music and all when there's like 20 odd people there. So I don't know how that's going to work, but I'm sure they're going to try and make as much of a, a fuss and um, as they possibly can. Uh, or ITV Racing hasn't carried crowd noise thus far on their on their uh, coverage. So it'd be intriguing to see if they do sort of introduce that because it's something that um, Racing TV, when they came over here first, did introduce fake hoof noises during the races. Because even when you're during a race, like there's no sound if you're if the action is away from the crowd. So they actually already include a backing track of literally, you know, hooves thumping on the ground. And oh, right. uh, there's, a, a, there's a fake noise as they jump over the fences. So there is that already oh, right. uh, it's just whether they add an element of um of crowd noise to it as well i mean now that you mention it the sound of the jump has always been very similar and quite pronounced i assumed it was real it's fake <laughs> well, no well some are real i mean obviously there are microphones down at the ones at the last and the like but no they don't have a pitch side microphone at every single jump and every single race so yeah there is just a uh, there is just a backing track that just goes along of the hoofprints. I feel like Mind blown. I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm telling you some sort of state secret here. Or, you Whoa. know, you've just been told about the Easter Bunny. 
Whoa. Tom. Yeah, I know, yeah. I mean, look. I mean, what? Okay. I know. We, we like, yeah. So they just have, so they just, once wow. the race jumps off. So sometimes, like, obviously I watch way too much racing TV. So obviously sometimes they mistime it and they'll have the kind of galloping noises start before the race. But generally they're pretty good at it. Okay. The galloping noise is fake too. Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Right. The galloping noise is fake. <laughs> well, like, they can't have a microphone. Well, not there. Like, it's TV. Around. Mics are cheap these days. You can get them. Like, I thought there was somebody was mic'd up at all points, but obviously not. You thought there was just a guy, a boom off, just following him around in a truck. On a what? horse. Pretty yeah. much. Uh, right. Okay. Jesus, Tom. <laughs> On that note. <laughs> Good luck. Thanks a million. <laughs> Thanks, Tom Malone is going to be part of our, our Tottenham coverage all week next week. Uh, dropping truth bombs and. Um, uh, killing our dreams uh, on a daily basis. OTBAM live in association with Gillette. Good morning, start with Gillette. Giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. I want to tell you about Golf Weekly, which, uh, as you know by now, is on the move. It's the world's best golf podcast. As of today, there are no more freebies. It is moving to Patreon exclusively. If you sign up, you'll get a guaranteed podcast every Thursday and extra episodes around the biggest tournaments of the year. There'll be interviews with golf's biggest names as well. You can become an official friend of the pod. You'll be able to chat to the lads, Joe, Nathan, Peter and Fionn. You'll get invites to our golf days and you'll enjoy exclusive watch parties around the majors. Get on to otbsports.com forward slash golf weekly and sign up now for $3.99 a month or just search golf weekly on patreon.com. The page is live now. It is 20 minutes past nine. Every week around about this time, we uh, drop in on Sue Murphy to get some recommendations about what you should be watching, what's new, what's old, what's the update. Sue Murphy, good morning to you. How are you? Hi, how are you? Good. We're starting with what's new this week. Yes. Um, the big one, well, the one that I've been watching over the last week is Your Honour, which is the Brian Cranston um, new, it's about, it's 10 episodes. I kind of, I'm over and back about how I feel about this because I've watched two episodes now and I, it, like, I, it's very similar in some ways to Breaking Bad because it's that kind of idea of, what would a dad do to protect his family and protect his kids? So his son, Adam, kills a, a kid on a motorbike called Rocco Baxter, who's the son of Jimmy Baxter, a local mob boss. And uh, he decides in his wisdom that he's going to protect him and uh, he's not going to bring him down to the police station. He's not going to uh, turn him over. And it's kind of this idea of like, how far would you go for your kid? Because... He's a judge and a kind of really renowned local judge um, who's well liked to uh, really roots for the people that it, like goes well out of his way in the first episode to help a woman who's been accused of something. And it's it's fine. Like it's it's perfectly watchable. And I've watched two episodes and I keep going, but it's not there's no depth to it, if that makes sense. It's very like Brian Cranston's judge character is very, I'm a very good man. And the Jimmy Baxter character is, I'm a very bad man. And I like that might change across the course of the episodes as well. To, like I imagine his character will change to, to protect his kid. But the first, that's what I felt about it. It was just kind of like a bit flat, which yeah. was a bit disappointing. There's a lot of that around at the moment. There's loads of like very well produced. And when you were like, oh, the costumes are great. Remember we had that, I was like, yeah, the least they can expect is that everything is going to be good. And there's so much stuff now like this where um, so much money has gone in. The production values are really high. The costume design is excellent. The lighting is incredible. It's just boring. And I haven't seen this, <laughs> right? But there's loads of just boring yeah. stuff out there. Like that nonsense with Hugh Grant and Nicole Kidman that you got sucked into is like, it all oh, it looks really pretty, but it was shite, ultimately. It was a complete waste of time. <laughs> yeah, like, and I got to the end of that, I was like, well, that was a waste of time. <laughs> yes, but there's a lot of that stuff out there. Like, I, I, the night of was supposed to be, you know, um, uh, searing questions about the relationship between race and America at the moment. Like, there's loads of other better stuff that's already done this in a more interesting way. This is just like... I gave up on the night off. 15 episodes, really too much. It, it, and exactly. Yeah. Like... So I don't know. That's why these recommendations are quite important. I, I, I mean, it's your job to watch the end of your honour, but uh, until you get to the end and go, oh, you know what, it really turned around. I'm like, nah, no thanks. I've, uh, there's <laughs> loads of other good stuff out I there. I that's fine. I, I feel like I'm doing it a bit of a just. I think people who, you see, Brian Cranston is just great. Like, And he's, imp like, he's impossible not to like in absolutely everything he's in, no matter how bad he is. Well, go and watch so, Malcolm in the Middle. Like, get it on YouTube. 
Go and watch Malcolm in the Middle. If you want some Brian Cranston fix, go and watch Malcolm in the Middle. It's sensational. Poor Brian Cranston. Um, I'd say the other one is probably more up your street than this week. Uh, Last Chance Youth Basketball. Um, they have... So they, the first five seasons, I'm, I'm sure you guys have seen this, have you? I've seen... I, like, I watched the first one and then I couldn't go back to it. The really? first episode, I... I yeah. First I, season. I, 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 oh, first season. I've only seen one episode of this thing and it was really good and again one of those it was one of those things where life got in the way and then it wasn't high enough up on the list of the pandemic stuff so I've only ever seen one episode of this but it, it was really good and uh, I get I get it Maybe Yeah I'm, I'm obsessed with it I just I absolutely loved like I I actually gave up on the third season because I felt like all of the players had become too aware of the cameras and were kind of playing up to a little bit. Whereas I felt like in the first season in particular, they just, it was very fly in the wall document, documentary. But they, they've they moved now. They had uh, five seasons with Mississippi, Kansas and California. And now they've gone to um, basketball. So it's the Huskies is the name of the team and they're East, uh, East Los Angeles College. But they're run by this coach called John Mosley and... Honestly, you will watch it for this guy alone. He is, I know where they get these coaches from. These guys are just insane. And they're pushing these kids to the absolute limit. Like one of the kids is like, I mean, I only get Christmas off. <laughs> like, they're really just making sure that they like, cause they're a level below obviously getting into college football and they're trying to get scholarships. So they're really pushing these kids to make sure they're able to submit all their reports, that they're showing up on time. They're showing up to all of their practices. And you kind of end up rooting for those characters because they really are like the captain of the team has lost his mother to cancer. His father had died the year before. It's just like really sad stories of really like really deprived kids who end up in these amazing programs where they have structure and they have responsibility and they have these amazing coaches who root root for them. And I just find it impossible not to like. I like every time I get watch these, I'm just about happy with it and I'm like, yeah, I want to adopt all of these children. And fair play to these guys who are looking after them. Because it really just shows up the other side of it, the tracks around around college football, around football, which is such a massive, massive business in the States, you know? Yeah. I mean, it, it also serves just, to highlight how broken American society is. And my, absolutely. I definitely have a voyeuristic difficulty with this. It's like, for my entertainment, these children have been ghettoized, had their lives ruined by, uh, you know, centuries of oppression and... Now, Netflix is hooking me in and saying I should watch this as entertainment. Yeah, I understand where you're coming from, but at the same time, does it not like highlight that? I don't and know. Does it not show? I think it leeches off it. To be honest, so oh. I think it's like, it's like, because um, nothing's going to change from these shows. Ultimately, that college, uh, that JUCO college football program in Mississippi in the first season didn't really change. That that head coach didn't really change. He got a bit famous. And he makes more money from appearances and maybe his recruitment is a bit easier or a bit harder depending on whether or not people liked him. But ultimately, I don't think these programs are any way an agent of change. I actually think that they're just leeching off the pores of society and saying, I so here's this, here's this tragic story. Of the... Yeah, like I think they just show an aware, like they highlight, they, they give an awareness to these situations because I think a lot of people who watch these games outside of America who maybe wouldn't be familiar with the ins and outs of how these kids end up in the NFL or you know, the NBA, they might think, oh, these guys, these guys just want, these guys really work their asses off to get to this point. I mean, there's one bit where one of the guys is sitting there and he's like, I don't want to do this report. And they're like, they've been training all day. They've been up since six o'clock in the morning. I, I just think it really highlights what they have to go through to get to that level. And it's not easy. And I don't know, I don't think that really takes advantage. I think it, I think it really pushes them into the spotlight. Sheehan. Yeah, I'm kind of with Sue on this as well. I am i don't really feel the sense of voyeurism that goes on with this. Maybe that just uh, speaks to my morality being in a worse place and maybe I just don't have uh, the moral compass that, that other people have. But I've, I've never really felt that I'm like, this is uh, a lot of these stories. You just trying to shade me for having a moral compass. Uh, that was <laughs> de definitely done there, Owen. Good man. Right, move on. <laughs> Poor own. Um, sorry. I've the, seen one episode the of the thing. Like, I mean, co coming to me for like the definitive sort of uh, <laughs> moral tone on this. I've seen one episode. I don't know, but I didn't. I didn't feel guilty watching it. I just didn't watch it because I didn't have time. It okay. to do with my okay. sense of guilt. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> What's next, Sue? <laughs> not all out there. Uh, the Comey rule. 
uh, this is on now TV at the moment, and uh, like it was on Sky last year. It picked up a lot of nominations. Golden Globe nomination for Brenda Gleeson. Um, I think Jeff Daniels got a nomination as well for playing James Comey. It's two episodes. It's very long. It's, I think it's about three or like it's basically feature length episodes. This is re- I really liked it. Now the music re- reviews of this have been a little bit mixed. I think it comes down like it's based on Comey's book. So it's very forgiving of a lot of the things that Comey had, had done. And it's the lead up to the 2016 election and his investigation into Hillary Clinton, which they talk about and some of the stuff about Trump and the Russian investigation. But there's a, an amazing scene, like the whole thing is worth watching for this scene where Comey gets called to the White House by Trump for a dinner and Trump basically demands his loyalty. But the tension, like it's just the two of them sitting at a table and it's a very long scene and you can tell how uncomfortable Comey is. He doesn't want to be there. He doesn't want to have this conversation. And Gleason, Brenda Gleason is absolutely phenomenal in that scene. It's so, so good. But I like I had to keep reminding myself that it wasn't fact. Because every time like they gave an explainer for what had happened or what happened with the Hillary investigation, and I was like, oh, that's what happened there. No, Susan, this is this is fiction. This is based on a book. You had to keep reminding yourself because it's very, very close to the events. Like you'd have to look very hard to find out what parts that are wrong. You'd have to know the story inside out because it is very intricate. And they give you a lot of a lot of information. But I actually I really enjoyed the performances. And I think if you're into American politics or anything like that, you'll, you'll really appreciate this. Okay, so the Comey rule, I haven't seen it, all of you? No, I haven't either, to be honest. Okay. Very good. Uh, Honestly, very good. Uh, how's, how's your rewatch of The Wire going on? Really well. This is, I know we're kind of out of time here, but this is so much better on the rewatch. And the first watch was like one of the best television experiences of all time. I didn't enjoy episode one that much first time i watched it second time i watched it back i'm still on season one by the way it was sensational i've gone back to look at how it was received at the time though to see if other people weren't blown away by it the first time new york times and this is a really cold take that's that that's come back up for them their review of the initial season of the wire this is from the new york times the show seems to go out of its way to be chopping and confusing not giving viewers the traditional this is who and what's what opening it's all served up in a dialogue heavy with police speak and dealer speak sometimes unintelligibly so the language is supposed to be realistic and maybe it is realistic but it often feels self-conscious like an overly thick southern accent and this is the killer line the wire doesn't have the pulsating addictive urgency of 24 which just completed a spectacular first season on Fox. It shows us a more realistic version of life, complete with downtime, yak sessions, drunken story swapping. What did I say a couple of weeks ago when Star came into our lives? You've got to get on 24. Uh, New York Times says it here, 24 is better than The Wire. I am vindicated. Uh, This may be a terrible take on The Wire, but I'm happy that 24 is coming out. I can't believe you managed to bring 24 into a conversation about The Wire. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. The New York Times, one of the new, the world's most no, famous newspaper. No, it's so far away it. from the wire. <laughs> Awful. It, <laughs> better, better first season than than the wire, according to people who know what they're talking about. Too. So, I'm, who am I to? Well, that's to, to just blatant that. lie. I actually went back. I'm on second episode, but I mean, it's much. It's even better on the rewatch. I mean, I watched this on a, a projector screen the first time I watched it, and I forgot how good it actually looks when it's on a really good screen. But no, that's just lies on. We've been taken in. How? Who wrote uh, that on? Do you know? Oh God, I I will uh, copy and paste uh, this into Google straight away. I don't, I don't know, but no, honestly, anybody who has watched The Wire only once, like like I had done, the second time is just so much more satisfying. The uh, author on that piece, by the way, is Neil Genslinger. Right. The Omar Levy scene in the courtroom was on Sky Atlantic last night and uh, you can't not watch it because it's an absolute classic. Stone Cold, you can also drop in and out of any episode pretty much and go, oh, I forgot that happened because as the intricacy is the thing that makes it stand up. We'll talk in more detail about that a little bit later on. If you've got any views on The Wire, you want to talk about it, 0879-180-180 is the number. OTBAM live in association with Gillette. Good morning, start with Gillette, giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. Uh, there was one other thing that you wanted to talk about, Sue, was there? Um, the... Oh, just Bake Off. I just wanted to have a rant about Bake Off because I think a lot of people are watching it and Noel Fielding's not involved and they need to just stop, I think. They need to stop making Bake Off. That's it. <laughs> it's over. Bake Off is over. It's jumped the shark. It's sure, like, well, it's Matt Lucas presented at the moment and it's a special one for cancer, stand-up to cancer, so I'd have to give into it because, it, like, you have to around the charity stuff, obviously. But anytime they're, like, they've just moved presenters too many times and 
they're really overdoing some of the edits on it. And I just like, I think people are just starting to get a bit bored with it, which is really disappointing. Because it's one thing that's been getting people through lockdown is just like nice programs that don't actually demand too much of you. Oh, and are you a Bake Off fan? Yeah, I do. I do like Bake Off. I like it. I'm not on the the level of having an in depth um, knowledge of it that Sue has. Like I, I've only dipped in and out of it whenever it's on, like more for or something like that. Like it's such a good show. It it it, it is the one the ultimate easy watch out there. Like I'm I'm surprised to hear such a such a take though that that Bake Off should should be pulled because no matter who it is, like I know Noel Fielding was great and all that, and the preview like all the different casts they've had of have been quite good, I thought. I, I I just think the format itself is bigger than any one individual. I thought the original chemistry was good. I haven't, I'm just getting sick of it. I haven't gone back to it. <laughs> so you're saying Noel Fielding's no good? Oh, no, Noel Fielding is great. Right, you but both think he's great. Okay. Yeah. yeah, they had Noel and Sandy who were presenting it, and they Sandy's left, and now they have Noel Fielding with Matt Lucas. And that took a while because it's really hard when you're a real Bake Off fan to really bed in with the new people. And then Noel kind of disappeared out just before Christmas because they were doing specials and now it's just Matt. And like, I, I know he's going to be back for the next season, but I feel like there's a kind of a wedge now. There's a All problem. Right. All right. Martin Furlong on YouTube says, I watched the first four episodes of The Wire. I just can't get into it. It's nowhere near the quality of shows like The Sopranos. It's pretty close. I would argue The Sopranos is still slightly ahead of uh, The Wire and I'm nearly I'm on, back on season four of The Wire. Um, uh, but we'll we'll have yeah. that debate. Don't worry, that's coming down the tracks. That's uh, we're going to clear the decks for that one and do it properly. OTBM live in association with Gillette. Good morning, start with Gillette. Give me the confidence to tackle the day ahead. Thanks for that, Sue. Uh, you can uh, hear more from Sue on uh, News Talk, of course, and uh, follow her on Twitter as well. We're going to hear from Alan Quinlan tomorrow, as usual, on a Friday, and the crappy quiz as well. For now, though, we want to go back to the analysis of Scotland and Ireland. Uh, here is Scotland legend Andy Nicholl and former Ireland captain Neve Briggs talking about the game on Sunday. So Andy, how many points are Ireland going to win this by? Five, ten, what are you feeling? <laughs> uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a fix. I love the Ireland-Scotland fixture, but it's given us a lot of pain over the years, I have to say. And uh, it's, uh, we've been on the, the wrong end for on, on many a, a, a battering. There's been some tight games, I guess. I mean, last year, the Six Nations that kicked off in, in uh, Dublin, didn't it? Mm. And that was a tight game. And if, you know, Stuart Hogg hadn't dropped the ball over the line, who knows? But, uh, you know, we've also had some pretty dark days. Yokohama, for starters. Um, and even the, the, the game in the Autumn Nations Cup was almost back to sort of Yokohama-esque, the way that Ireland were able to just bully Scotland, especially up front. And that's where I think... Scotland have improved and I think the pack that uh, Scotland are have now able to get out in the pitch is one that can can go toe to toe with with many packs. Well Neve that's the worry isn't it because I mean I ask uh, Andy by how many points but we're all very worried about this game I mean uh, genuinely Scotland have improved in that area where we always felt however we were going even in 2019 in Yokohama Ireland could bully Scotland and get around the edge and, and, and get the job done whereas now there's a sense they have improved in that area and they have some unbelievable players behind that improved pack and you know it's hard to know how to feel about this one to say the least yeah absolutely i think there's a lot of nerves for, for that game the weekend i think um scotland have been playing really really well i think they've been building since since japan to be honest i think not not just in player spec but also about um how they go about playing the game you know they've obviously run things a lot through through Finn Russell, but I think Stuart Hogg's ability to control the ball and phase play and control the game um is probably one of the best in the world from a from a back three perspective. So yeah, look it's gonna be it, it, it's gonna be a really difficult game for Ireland. I think I'm really looking forward to the battle, especially the back row battle. I think um Hamish Watson's probably having an unbelievable tournament and um for me he's more than likely going to be the, the sevens lines maybe and um so if Ireland can quell that back row, I think um, they could be a a chance, but it's going to be difficult. Andy, just for a second to go big picture and put the Ireland-Scotland rivalry into some kind of context over the last, say, 30-odd years. I was reading Jerry Thornley laid out all the stats in the Irish Times over the last couple of days. Ireland, uh, this century, have finished above Scotland in the Six Nations table in 20 of the 21 Six Nations, the only exception being 2013, which marked the end for Declan Kidney. And... Ireland have also won of the 22 meetings this century, 18 of them. It's such a change from the 90s where there were 12 games and the Scots won 11 and drew one. You were, you know, in and around that 
beginning of the changing of the guard coming off the period of dominance for Scotland. You know, is, is the fair sense? I mean, we certainly feel Irish rugby improved. Did Scotland also go into a, a big decline? And, and what was the area specifically of the decline? Um, it definitely went into decline. Professional rugby, Joe, was the, the big uh, changing point and the turning point. You know, I, I got my first cap in 92. We, you know, no disrespect, we, we saw the Ireland as a guaranteed win just about every year. That was That's the way it was at the time. So did everyone. Um, yeah, and my, my second cap was uh, in Lansdowne Road and I, I scored in the corner and I thought international rugby is uh, easy. And uh, But professional rugby was uh, what really uh, hindered Scotland. Um, and what was strange, really strange, and I've looked at this and analysed it, you know, Ireland and Scotland had basically the same structures in the rugby environment going into professional rugby. We had clubs, we had districts and international, you guys had clubs, mm. provinces, international. Yet you made the transition unbelievably well and we struggled and a lot of it was down i would over many a, a glass of red wine with keith wood over the years discussing why it was so different and and you know because edinburgh glasgow there's been a rival it's the longest standing fixture club fixture in world rugby yet there's not the rivalry that exists there uh, between say leinster and munster and uh, and so one one factor, which sounds a small factor, is that that you had home home grounds like Donnybrook as it was for Leinster, Thomond Park, and and Ravenhill as it was, and then the county ground, the sports ground in Galway. We were peripatetic. Our Edinburgh and Glasgow in the in the south, they went round all the club grounds, so they never had that sense of identity when the game went professional, and that meant Scotland were then catching up for a number of years, and to be fair, never really have caught up. So you know, in, in the in the twenty what twenty six years that the games were twenty five years the games been professional, we've been we've been way behind everyone and trying to catch up and and you know we tried four districts to start with and then we went to three went to two back to three and at two and with two you've got a limited number of players and that but we can only afford two good sides and that's what Edinburgh are now Edinburgh and Glasgow are now so there's been so many things but you can put it all back down to the game of rugby union turning professional in 1996. Okay, and we, we, was the quality of player being produced not as good as well? Or like, are, can we explain that as part of professional rugby? Why, or, or were the players there just lacked some kind of structure? Um, a bit of everything really, Joe. I think, uh, you know, I, I've been quite critical recently of our academy structure. I just don't see the numbers being produced um, from the, there's four academies in, in, in Scotland. I look at the number of quality players that almost one academy in Ireland, the, the Leinster Academy, the quality of players that, the, that that academy produces is unbelievable. Now, I know it's coming out of a number of schools, mm. but we've got a number of really rugby playing schools in Scotland. So I, I just don't see that development uh, happening in the same way. So, um, you know, we there is a, a lack of players. We, we've not got a lot of players, but then neither do Ireland. You know, now I've always used Ireland as the comparison and, you know, you've got competing um, sports as well, whereas, you know, football is, is huge here in Scotland, um, but, you know, we've not got hurling and, and everything else to, to contend with. So I've just looked on with envy, really an envy about how Ireland have got their structures right mm. and that pathway right and developing new players coming through. We produce the odd good player every year. We've got some good young ones coming through. There's a couple of youngsters have just emerged into the Glasgow team in the last couple of weeks. But they're just ones or twos, whereas you see Ireland producing so many. And you know, and here's an indictment: our under twenties got relegated from the top tier last year in the in the under twenty World Championship. And so that means we are not playing against Ireland or England or in the Six Nations if it was taking place mm -hmm. uh, right now and the, and the World Championship coming up in the summer. So that is that's that's an indictment of this lack of talent. Um, conveyor belt. There's just not, there's ones or twos coming off it, not the 10. And when you're a small country like we are, talent identification should be easy. You shouldn't let anyone slip through the net. But I just don't think we're developing them the right way. Mm. Neve, give us a sense of just how worried you are about this game. Because Paul O'Connell said yesterday that in his time, going back to his debut in 02, this is the best Scottish side he's come up against. And they were obviously very impressive at Twickenham albeit there are mitigating factors around England at the moment. And then from 17-3 up against Wales, they blow it, you know, and the Fagerson sending off notwithstanding. But, I mean, it was a silly thing for him to do as well, so it's not like Scotland are blameless in terms of going down to 14 men. The point has been made about Wales. They never give you a game, really. They make you win it, and they hang on, and that's why they overachieve. Whereas with Scotland, 
you'd almost feel over the years the opposite is true. They could they do some daft things. Stuart Hogg not grounding that ball, for instance, last year, and they'll talk themselves up, and ultimately there's a soft underbelly. So, like, are, are we are we kind of worried but still feeling ultimately we'll get through this? Um, I would be worried. I think that Scotland... Um, I know we were talking about England afterwards, that game in terms of that England really were rusty and off the pace, but I think... Scotland didn't give them a chance to get into the game. Their line speed was incredible. Their ability to find grass in the backfield was um, as good as any team. They tactically, technically were really astute for that whole 80 minutes. I think against this was what we had spoken about after that game. You know, could they mentally get up for for the Wales game after uh, such a high in Twickenham? Could they consistently perform? And they didn't. But as I was talking to and and Andy before here, and um, we came on. It was it's you know they've had a four week break now because they've not played against France obviously. So, a does that stop their momentum from an Irish perspective? I hope it does a bit. But also, does it refresh them after that tough game against Wales for them to be able to go again in in a like manner like they did against England? They're almost restarting the tournament, and that's probably my biggest concern. Mm. Andy, how should we not play against Scotland? What do they want? Um, they they certainly want a broken field. Um, I think if you play a structure and uh, if you play like you've done against Scotland in the last ten years, then that's a good start. Which is you know that physical physicality up front. But Scotland have got a pack now. I think there's been there's been subtle changes taking place, mm. and there's been big changes in the in Gregor Townsend's coaching team. So Steve Tandy in defence, Peter De Villiers at scrum time at scrum and John DL. You know, John DL's maybe somebody that you wouldn't have heard about. And um, but he's done a fantastic job. And um, you know, the, the, there is strength and depth now as well. You know, again, it's been over the years Scotland might get a good first team on the pitch, but as soon as the subs come off the bench, there's a real drop off and you would fall away in the last twenty minutes of games. Well, at the moment you've got quality coming off the bench there as well. So mm. you know they, they are develop developing a, a, a deeper squad. Um you know I think we got look back at those first two games, huge confidence of being England at Twickenham and the way the way we did it. It should have been a twenty point win. You know, we were hanging on if you like at the end, but we shouldn't have it shouldn't have been. It was it was much more convincing than that. And and there's there's no attack, there's there's brilliant shape and attack and it's the variety of attack that is good. And Finn Russell is at the heart of that. But Stuart Hogg at 15, when he was the only player that really had a cutting edge, then that meant you could cut off the source. And that's what Ireland have done over the years very well. They've just absolutely flown up in the midfield and stopped the ability to get the ball out to Hogg. But when you've got uh, Finn Russell now at 10, and you've got Chris Harris, who's playing really well at 13. You've got Dune van der Merwe in the wing, who's pull, ripping up trees at the moment. When you've got all that cutting edge with Cam Redpath making his debut at Twickenham and very impressive, you know, it means that there's a cutting edge throughout the back line now. So, so Ireland can't just sniff out, snuff out the attack, the threat that comes from 15. So I, I think there's, it's a, it's a full pronged attack Scotland have now, which actually makes them quite uh, dangerous to play against and very difficult to defend against. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. So Neve, Irish defence will be stressed and it's a, it's a more complicated offering from Scotland. In terms of the Irish attack, listening to Andy talk there and other people, that point about a structured Irish performance being maybe the best way to get past Scotland makes sense on the face of it. It's just interesting timing in that we're after the uh, performance in Rome where we saw more, you know, heads up on the structured play and we're looking for more offloads and more creativity and spontaneity. It sort of, it sort of sounds like uh, that might be, you know, there might be a pause button pressed on that for Murrayfield. I hope there isn't, to be honest. I think that we've got to go and take that level of attack that we um, played against it against Italy and try and expand on it. I think um, a lot will be dependent on the players that we pick. Um, I think, um, you know, if we do pick Gibson Park, say, for example, at nine, um, we don't want him box kicking because the box kicking isn't as um, effective as Conor Murray's. And then, therefore, you're going to give um, Stuart Hogg all this room to be able to pick apart um, broken defences. And let's face it, he's really good at that. Um, I still want us to attack. I still want us to be square to the line. I still want us to be able to come around the corner and attack a pace and um, and not be shackled by the fact that we're playing Scotland, that we can't look to throw that extra pass or that offload. And I think that that's going to be really important. And um, 
yeah, look, if, if I'm Scotland, you're, you're going to do, set your defence up like we're going to box kick all day and um, kick the corners and try and find a little bit of grass to be able to set peace. And um, But, you know, you'd like to think that Ireland can try and come with another level of attack, I suppose, and, and another level of performance than what we saw against Italy. Well, Neve, if we're box kicking to Stuart Hogg the way we box kicked to Bree Doolan, it's going to be a long day. Yeah, 100%. And I, I really hope that that's not the case. And I, 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 I think that Gibson Park, Murray, you know, that selection is going to be really interesting. I think, um, to be fair to Gibson Park, he's, you know, he's, he's done okay, he's done well, he's, he's got pace. And um, if we play to his strengths, then, you know, we select him. But if we, you know, select Conor Murray, we can't go back to that slow nature game because... He's slow and then sex and slower because, you know, the ball's in, in the air for too long. And let's face it, Johnny was really good against Italy taking the ball at pace because the ball was quicker coming from Gibson Park, if that makes any sense. Mm. So you'd like to see if Murray is playing that his his remit then is just to fire the ball out, just go, run. You know, five, six years ago, Conor Murray was one of the best scrum halves in the world because he had a cut. He was able to have a look around the edges. He was able to, to, to you know, make decisions on the go. Whereas the last few years, you know, whether it's down to game plan structure, I'm not really sure, but it's it's just been a lot slower in nature. Andy, be brutal. We're not sensitive. We can take it. What's your general perception of Ireland last couple of years? Well, last couple of years... Um... Say post think, post nineteen post nineteen World Cup. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it's it's not been. I mean, Andy Farrell. I, you know, that's an interesting dynamic when you when you step up from being the the defence coach to head coach or, and the, the the motivator into the strategic coach. Um, that can be difficult. I mean, he's a he's a class act. Don't get me wrong, mm. but that's a very that's a changed dynamic, and maybe that's taken a while to, to find its feet. I mean, listen, you could easily have won the first two games in the Six Nations here without much having to, to have changed. So, you know, it's not it's not desperate. And then when you when you go to Rome and you get so much confidence playing against Italy and scoring the tries that you did, that, that can that can really just turn things around. As I say, it's 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 margins, fine margins all the time. And and that's the same with Scotland, to be perfectly honest, because there was a drop off in quality of performance from Twickenham to Murrayfield against Wales, and that was enough to 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 blow a 17-3 lead. You know, we were in there 20 we were in 22 looking so convincing. We got a try there, 24-3, game over. And and we'd be going three from three into playing France. And so um or sorry, two from two into playing France. So mm. it's 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 there's fine margins. And so you know, there's not much it doesn't take much for Ireland to suddenly click into gear. Look at Wales. You know, they've been sort of just plodding along in many ways, but they've just found a way to win games. And, OK, things have gone their way. But then when they needed to against England, when they came back, they just turned it up. And, and, it, and it didn't take a whole, huge amount of difference in strategy or anything like that. So Ireland have got great players. Ireland have got champions in that team. And uh, and so they can click back into you know the the familiarity in the back line with the the Leinster back line that played against Italy you know will that go into against Scotland on Sunday you know I think Ring Ring Henshaw and Ringrose as a midfield um, pairing are just fantastic and they're really excited about how they're playing so you know Ireland are a, a good side that maybe just haven't been playing as well as they can but that mm. can click as we saw in Rome very very easily. Well, we're hoping. It feels like a couple of years now we've been waiting for it. Uh, Finn Russell, needless to say, is on uh, people's minds. Johnny Sexton, have a listen, was talking about Finn Russell at his uh, press conference this afternoon. He's obviously a big threat for, for us, um, no, you know, knowing that he's got a, a full box of tricks that he that he tries to pull out uh, most games and uh, you know, he's obviously a threat to the line. He's got a, a, a good short kicking game. Um, you know he he can pull the strings if we let him and and uh, you know he's hurt he's hurt us in the past before we haven't played against him the last couple of times we've played Scotland um, so again we've we've kind of had to go back and and look at some old footage but uh, he's been in good form for his club and uh, yeah he's a, he's a massive threat like they have across their across their team but obviously when you got him and Hogg they're probably the the standout guys but um, yeah we have to be on our on our game this week to to stop them. So, Andy, if you're sitting on your couch watching Finn Russell over the years, where, where where's the uh, ratio of that's absolutely brilliant Finn Russell to, oh, my God, Finn Russell, what are you doing? Well, remember, I played with his coach, Gregor, when he was uh, in his day, and Gregor Townsend was exactly like that as well. Mm. You know, you, you win your games, but you lose games as well. And uh, 
I see, I've seen a maturity in Finn Russell. Um, and let's be honest, what happened this time last year has probably helped. COVID actually came at a good time for Scotland and the relationship between Gregor and, and Finn. And uh, he's gone away. He's, re he's realised that international rugby is really important and how you conduct yourself coming back from a big club like Racing is, is uh, you know, you've got to, to come back into to how that team environment is. And so... I think he he's the complete standoff at the moment. It's great to hear Johnny Sexton. You could almost sort of uh, hear the pride in his voice because there's the respect from one standoff to another. And, and Finn Russell's got it all at the moment. He's got the variety in attack. He's got the kicking game, probably the best kicking game in the world rugby at the moment, the variety of kicks as well. You know, the short kicking, long kicking, everything like that. But what was really pleasing, I guess, from a Scotland perspective was that we won at England, we won at Twickenham without Finn Russell playing that well. He yeah. actually, you know, he's a couple of moments and he had a couple of great things, but he didn't have his best game. Mm. And so there's more to come. And that's where when you've when you've got a backline now that Scotland have, there's other threats. And that makes Finn Russell even more dangerous because it used to be the case, and we mentioned it earlier, if you want to stop Scotland playing, you just cut out the source. They cut out the source to the ball getting out to Stuart Hogg, and that meant you were, you were, you were closing down Finn Russell. There's players around him. He, When you've got players like Cameron Redpath, I don't think is going to be back this weekend, but James Lang um, is, a, is a good player at 12 as well, and Chris Harris, as I say, has been really well. Finn Russell loves defences coming to him, so he can offload and these guys can play off him. He doesn't mind that. He loves the physical side of it. But when you've got nobody to offload, nobody creative to offload, then that's when you can see how teams have been able to really stop Scotland playing. So um, Finn Russell is playing very well in a better team. And that is always the case. You need players around you to allow somebody like that to show off his talents. Mm. Stuart Hogg's in the form of his life as well. I mean, a Twickenham, oh, yeah. he was absolutely ridiculous. Oh, I mean, and so there's... Uh, We've got that uh, added dimension that he's playing for Exeter, so Scotland don't control him throughout the Six Nations. And Hoggy went back to play for Exeter last weekend. Well, that's good. Hoggy, he thrives on playing. He wants to play. He's one of those players, he just gets better the more he plays. And obviously, we were, fingers crossed, he got through unscathed injury-wise. And I think he, he had some ice at the end of the game, which was a bit concerning for Scotland fans. But I think he got through OK. And he's just, he's just playing with that confidence. And again, there's a maturity to his game. The, the captaincy has sat well with him. You know, some people, you give your captaincy to your best player, it doesn't always work. And, and I think uh, with Stuart Hogg, it is working. And he's not worrying too much about the communication with the referee. Because let's be honest, fullback's one of the worst positions to, mm. to, to captain from, because you're not anywhere near the ball or, or the referee. Um, but he's just letting the players like Ali Price and Hamish Watson, Jamie, Jamie Ritchie, Johnny Gray, much closer to the action, um, control things. He's just leading by example. And what a leader, what an example he's giving because he's making he's making ground just by every time he gets the ball. And um, but he's not he's not throwing off some of these these offloads that he used to do. He's playing very maturely. And uh, you know, he's at the moment you would say he's um, number one full back in, uh, in in Britain and Ireland at the moment for uh, for a red shirt in the summer. Neve, I'll bring in in one second a few uh, Ireland selection questions. But so, Andy, if, if in broad terms, post 2019 here, where I'm, I'm sure Gregor Tenzin was under a bit of pressure afterwards, if we're saying that Scotland have become a bit more pragmatic and toughened up in the pack, which was always an Achilles heel, and then there's flair behind that pack, and you know the blend is starting to look really good. What is that chink that emerged against Wales? You know, what what is that kind of uh, self-destruct issue, psychological or otherwise, and how big a worry is that for you? Well, so to, uh, we, we, uh, sometimes I think we can, and as a pundit, you sometimes overanalyze things. We just dropped off against England. Our set play, the set piece was outstanding. Our defence was outstanding, and our discipline was exactly where it needs to be. Mm. And against Wales, it just dropped off slightly, not by much. So um, when we were seventeen three up, uh, we were not that ruthless in the in the twenty two. Our discipline, we then gave away three penalties one after the other, and then you go from one end of the pitch, almost scoring, to conceding a try at the other. And then the set piece, the, the, the defence of the driving mall was, was not very good and we lost a couple of liners. It's literally things like that can be the difference between winning a game of international rugby and losing. So I don't think Scotland, by beating England at Twickenham, it doesn't seem mean that all the ills have been solved mm. and they're now a great side. Mm. And losing to Wales doesn't mean that they've gone back to where they were. They just dropped off the levels of performance. And that, for me, was for the, the gap can be a good thing or a bad thing. I think it's a bad thing to have that month between Wales and, and now Ireland because the France game was off. Because I think they would have wanted to get straight back on that horse, get out to Paris and really test themselves against 
probably the best team in the championship um, and see if they can get back to the levels of accuracy and execution that they did at Twickenham and not have for the drop off they had against Wales. So, so I'm I, I'm really intrigued to see if Scotland mm. can get back to those uh, levels that we showed against England. And uh, and you know I'm I'm pretty confident we will. Mm. I mean, it's such a huge game for both sides. It trade it completely transforms how the championship will be viewed. So much at stake. Neve uh, Jacob Stockdale's back in the squad. Are we looking at Lowe and Larmer on the wings though starting? Yeah, I think it's going to be really difficult for Andy Farrell to drop either of them. Um, especially James Lowe, because he's put his money on him in terms of he's continuing to select him, even though he's had a couple of mistakes in, in the defensive line. And um, so, yeah, look, I, I think he he would be unfortunate for either of them. I suppose that's probably the rootless nature of, of this business. But I, I feel that it, there won't be many kind of positional or, or team changes um, from Italy. I think they went and did what was asked of them. They played well. And, um, you know, I think to get confidence and then to have the backing of that team, you just kind of got to go and select as much as you can similarly as long as everybody's fit. OTB AM with Gillette. Put your best face forward